Can you believe it? It's finally here. It's the most wonderful time of the year, unless you get stressed out about how to pay for it. Savewithconrad.com can help you make this the best Christmas ever. You won't make a house payment for the next two months. That's right. Skip your next two house payments and use all that cash for your extra holiday expenses. And come next year, you're going to have a lower monthly payment. Don't put Christmas on a credit card. Pay your credit card debt off at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. Savewithconrad.com. Hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Conrad. These early morning sessions, I feel like I'm doing morning drive again. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Uh, if I look like I just got out of bed, ladies and gents, you're right. You win the prize. I just got up about 20 minutes ago. Never hit the snooze bar when you need to get up. That makes no sense, but I did it. Here I am. Thank you for being with us, everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for being with us for a fun show. We've been revisiting 1997 and we will continue that journey with the very last pay-per-view from 1997 on the WWF side of things in your house, Degeneration X. But before we talk about that pay-per-view, I feel like we should talk about the ring of honor pay-per-view. We've got some new champions. As I understand it, Claudio Castagnoli is the new world champion, right? And, uh, the match everybody's really talking about, at least in my opinion, is that unbelievable dog collar match for the tag team titles. It feels like FTR have just, uh, ran the tag team division everywhere. They went holding the new Japan titles, the AAA titles and the ring of honor titles until this past Saturday afternoon It was an afternoon special. And my goodness, they stole the show again. This is the third straight pay-per-view from ring of honor as best I can tell that, uh, the Briscoes and FTR have stole the show. It yeah. somehow keeps getting better. I didn't think they could top it, but it seems like they did it again, Jim. Yeah, they had a great match. I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, I, I forgot that this pay-per-view was on the air until about, it started about 20 minutes ago, shall we say. And, uh, good old Jeff Jones out here is moving to Jacksonville. Why in the hell? I don't know, but nonetheless, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, I, uh. He sent me a link, God bless him. And, uh, I, I watched uh, the rest of the show. I think I picked it up in the, uh, uh, match with, uh, involving Athena. No. Oh, yeah. So that's where I jumped in and made my hot tag and messed up my hair and poured water on my head, squeezed my, t- <laughs> my tattoos, got all jacked. So, uh, it was good. It was good. Uh, so that's where I started, uh, the, but without a doubt, the match of the night or the afternoon, as it were, was, uh, the, uh, dog collar tag match. And it was just uh, absolutely unbelievable. I thought the thing that I, I, and I thought about this this morning and I don't understand why I, I had better things to think about, but I got up wondering, I wonder how sore those four guys are. And, uh, it was a piece of work. It was a piece of art. It was just, uh, crafted amazingly. They gritted their teeth. They did what they had to do. Tons of blood, whether you like that or you don't, that's what was there. Mm-hmm. So I thought these guys just did a terrific job telling the story. You know, I haven't seen that much work for the Briscoes, uh, in my, in my, uh, run around the track here. So I, I, I loved it. I thought they, those guys just did great. They got to be sore as hell today. Uh, their heads got to be sore. Their bodies got to be sore. And uh, I was surprised pleasantly. So, uh, not that I'm not an FTR fan because I am a huge FTR fan. I think they're just as good as tag team is in the pro wrestling business right now, but, uh, I hadn't seen the Briscoes that much and I loved the, everything they did to me was new. And I loved that. Uh, they had great creativity. Uh, just some great stuff, man. So all good, all good. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I take tip my hat if I had one on that, uh, it was just a, an amazing piece of work and I'm proud of those guys. Those are the matches and not just because of the blood folks, those are the kind of matches that you look at in amazement and, and admire the handiwork of four really professional guys. Yeah. So it, it was great. It was great. Their effort, uh, their heart, their soul was put in that match. It was very, very important to those guys to score the match of the night. And they did that quite frankly. 
you know, there's, there's other matches that were good. Yes. But, but, uh, you know, you always worry about following something like that. It's just almost impossible to do, but I, I really loved it. That's not the match of the week. albeit it may be the match of the year. Hell, I don't know. It was really great though. So, uh, my hat's off. Yeah, I think it was about 2,500, 3,000 people there, uh, as, as I heard it. And, uh, it just, it made me fun. It made it fun to be a wrestling fan again, because it has so many elements of the territory days and those big blow off matches and the juice and all that stuff. So I, uh, I'm really glad I remember that it was on and cause I was watching the army Navy game, right? Which ended up being a pretty good ball game. If you like defense and low scoring and passion. And I like all those things. So it was good. Conrad. I, I, you said you watched the, the dog collar match, right? I did. I, I didn't get a chance to see the entire pay-per-view, but I went out of my way to see that one. And, uh, I, I think the Briscoes and FTR are probably my two favorite tag teams and have been for quite a while. And for yeah. a long time, you know, several years ago, if you asked me, Hey, uh, what's your favorite tag team match? Uh, I might've said. The Young Pistols and the Midnight Express from Great American Bash 1990. But I think now I can pretty much say any match that the Briscoes and FTR have had this year, and maybe that dog collar match. I mean, it was it was something worth going out of your way to see. And I know yeah. that the Ring of Honor pay per view got a little bit of criticism online from fans, but when what they, they had what they, what they, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm just curious. What is there to criticize? What were they criticizing? I'm curious. Well, I think before that match was, uh, was put into the, into the order, a lot of fans were, were chirping online saying, is this really a $40 pay-per-view? Well, let me tell you this, that match was a $40 match. Uh, yeah. that's what I was getting to go out of your way to see it. If you had any hesitation of, I don't know if I want to see that it's an afternoon show and it's 40 bucks and they don't really, uh, whatever it is, go out of your way to see it to me, everything else. I'm sure everything else was great, but I wanted to see that. I saw it. It felt like I got my money's worth. So yeah, with you. unbelievable with you. match. Got to be a match of the year candidate. Uh, maybe the greatest, you know, and everybody wants to say everything's the greatest, but there has been a standard in dog collar matches for a long time. That was Roddy Piper and Greg, the hammer Valentine back at Starcade. in my mind. As far as a tag team dog collar match, that has to be right at the top of the list. My goodness, what a performance by both teams. Can't wait to see what's next for both teams. And I think Dax Harwood's probably had one of the best years any wrestler could have had. I mean, you take a look at all the different matches and all the different stipulations and singles matches and tag team situations. Uh, what a year Mr. Harwood's had this year. Yeah. Smart guy understands the business very well. So, and so does his partner. Yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm with you on, uh, that's going to be hard to top in any arena from any company. And some are going to say, well, it's too bloody. Well, what did you expect a dog collar match to be? Right. You know, uh, a trading of headlocks that ain't going to happen. So it was really good. Uh, I, I I'm proud of those guys. Uh, and uh, I wish I knew the Briscoe's better, uh, on a personal level. I don't, uh, I'd like to, uh, I don't know what the, their plans are for the future other than taking care of their chickens in Delaware. There ain't nothing wrong with that. No, so, uh, it was good. It was really good. I, I am proud of those guys. Their effort was ex ex exemplary and they, they showed other talents. What can happen if you put your heart and soul in your match and really invest unselfishly because they all sold, they all had their moments mm -hmm. and I, I just loved it. I thought it was just a. It brought me back to the older days of, of things, of those blow off scenarios. And ironically, it, even though the Briscoes won the match and won the titles, uh, I, I don't see this story being over at, at this point in time. I think there, there's more, there's more stuff on the, on the, on the back burner because I could watch these two teams work and wrestle every, every day. Uh, but their bodies would not hold up to every day. They're going to be sore for days, uh, after uh, what we saw. So it was really good. I'm proud of those guys. I'm happy to be in the business. Those matches make you happy that you're in the wrestling business. It wasn't a spot fest. It wasn't a flip flop and fly situation. They told a great story. They punished each other. Uh, they sold amazingly well. They were very keyword here, kids. They were very unselfish. Mm -hmm. Everybody got something in. Everybody got some material in that was really cool. So, uh, I'm a, a big fan of the, all four of those guys, especially after 
uh, Saturday afternoon. So they made me tune out the army Navy overtime game to watch it. So I, I, I uh, and I'm a football freak. So the army Navy was big to me, big when I was a kid. Uh, so anyway, it was, uh, it was really a fun, uh, watch. I go, I would, as Conrad said, and we don't, we say this all the time, or maybe not as enough, maybe we don't say it enough, go, go out of your way yes. and find that match and watch it all without somebody talking to you. Just sit in front of your TV or your computer, uh, and watch the damn match. You're going to be very happy that you did and took our advice on that one. And, uh, it is going to be the benchmark for, uh, dog collar matches in the future, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Agreed. So, so it's really good stuff. And I'm happy that, uh, we're talking about it and, and those guys get their, their hugs and, uh, just, a. It made my Saturday afternoon without a, without a doubt. And by the way, I want to also, uh, congratulate, uh, Ian Riccoboni and, uh, Caprice Coleman. I thought they did a nice job. I agree. Uh, they had good information. Uh, they had, there was a lot of information to cover. You know, Ian reminds me of me sometimes in the sense that he loves the more information that he can provide the viewer, uh, historical things like that, uh, the better. And he did a great job leading that commentary team, proud of his work. And, uh, and he's cause he's, his heart's in the right place. He's just a, a hell of a talent in the, on the, behind the mic. And, uh, so I, I just, I thought it was a hit all the way around. It was just a all the way around. Even I like Samoa Joe and juice Robinson because what they had to follow was damn near impossible. <clears throat> so <clears throat> pardon me. So anyway, good, good Saturday afternoon. And I'm not totally against, uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, pay-per-views. I loved it. Yeah. I thought it was good, man. So anyway, I'm glad we got to talk about that a little bit because it, it was deserving of all the praise that we could heap upon it. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Go out of your way to see it. Uh, it was match three of a three match trilogy, super card of honor. Uh, this past WrestleMania weekend, we had a, a 27 minute affair as uh, FTR would pick up a win over the Briscoes. We would do it again in July in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. And it was the main event here. It was two out of three falls. They gave them 43 minutes. FTR would pick up the win there. But what everybody's talking about right now is what happened this past weekend. Uh, the Briscoes beating FTR by referee stoppage where everyone bled. And I mean, everyone, the Briscoes are your new ring of honor champions. And the referee got color too, didn't he? He did indeed. Well, that's, that's ballsy. It's not something I've, I've, I've gotten. I've gotten color as a referee before back in the day. I was scared shitless, uh, because I'd never done that before. And so, uh, I, I've been a promise to myself after that, that I let somebody else do the whittling away, not me. And, uh, but I got color, but I had a little, I've always had a little help. It's not my forte. It's not how, right. I, how I got in the business, but, uh, it was just a, the, the whole thing was cool. It yes. was really good. And it's just really, really good. And I'm so glad I got to, I watched it. And, uh, I, again, I can't, I can't encourage you guys enough to check it out in some form or fashion. Uh, you're going to be happy that you did folks. We've heaped 15 minutes worth of praise on the match because it's that damn good. Uh, at, at our heart, Jim and I are just big wrestling fans and we big know rest we're huge. Look at yeah. us. Yeah. Come on. We're jacked up. We're on the gas. <laughs> get amazing how swollen we are. We've been oh. stung by bees. Yeah. Uh, go out of your way to see that match. Sincerely. It's one of the best matches that, uh, you're going to have a chance to see this whole dog on year, but let's talk about the end of my favorite year, 1997. Wait, you know what? There was one other thing. I don't know if you saw this past week, Jim, but your quote about Johnny Ace went what the kids would call viral. Did you see yeah. that? I don't know what viral means, but I know it got a lot of play. Um, was that an off the cuff feeling? Do you really feel that way? Any, uh, what do you mean, Mike? Sometimes, you know, we, sometimes when we say things, we see them in print later and we say, oh, well, I didn't mean it like that. Oh, I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> I meant it. All right. Uh, I just don't believe that that's how you repay somebody for their kindness. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, here's a guy that was out of a job, had a young family. I hired him. 
as my number two guy in my department. And then it, and how it ended up was typical chicken shit pro wrestling, just typical bullshit. And I didn't like the way that ended up. And, uh, Hey, look, if the guy's a better manager than me and he signed more stars than I, then so be it. I don't believe that to be accurate. Right. And, uh, you know, his, his goal was like a lot of the boys get close to the boss and that in itself makes it kind of nauseous to talk about, but no, I meant what I said. I, I don't wish any, him any ill will or bad health or, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't that. I hope the guy gets a job. He may have a job now. Hell, I don't know. I keep, I don't keep up with it and I, nor am I it's ir- irrelevant to me, but he did what he thought was he needed to do for his own safety. I found in him to be very insecure in that respect. And if I was a little coarse or callous on that whole thing, then I apologize, but, uh, I'm not apologizing for what I said, but, uh, I don't have any ill will. You know, he, he's, uh, he's had a lot of challenges, I guess, with his marriage and his wife's illness and so forth. I, I feel badly for her. She's a very nice lady. And, uh, but I just, I, I can't understand why that has to happen in wrestling as much as it does. As small as our community is, there's so much backbiting and BS that it's, uh, it's one of the reasons that a lot of guys get out of wrestling and most guys don't get out of wrestling because they can't afford to. Some of us can't afford to knock on wood. You hear that knock Conrad? I do. Good. That's me. I think I hear you knocking. I think I hear you coming in. <laughs> We're going to be coming in talking about, uh, in your house, TX. This is the third false finish where I tease the topic. I feel like I need to at least mention, dude, you were on tales from the territories last week. It was, uh, you and all your rowdy friends sitting down to talk about mid South. That looked like a lot of fun yourself, Jake, the snake Roberts, Ted DiBiase, and it was a whole host. It was a who's who from mid South, including, and I couldn't believe he got permission to do it. Shout out to the rock, I guess for pulling some strings, Michael PS Hayes. We never see him do anything out, out from under the WWE tent. That was a real treat. I enjoyed the program. Yeah, I did too. Michael was a, Michael's a great storyteller. Yes. Great instincts, great storyteller. He's got, he's got better recall than he actually probably deserves. Uh, so he's, he wasn't completely fried, but I, uh, Michael just, he, he's a great contributor, no matter what he's doing. Uh, and he, he helped that show get be, be better. I thought, and, uh, but I enjoyed that. They, I got a screener. I, I requested a screener because I was going to be traveling and I wanted to see it uh, sooner than later. And, uh, those guys and rocks group and, and uh, all those, all those dudes from, from Canada and all that, the vice guys, uh, they just did a terrific job and I enjoyed the editing. That's the thing about the, these, these shows, Conrad, that I noticed without being disrespectful, but the, the editing and the storytelling of these, uh, e- episodes is, uh, so much better than they were. And I'm not complaining. I, I, I watched all of it anyway. And would, would, would watch all of it anyway, but, uh, I thought it was just a e- excellent show. I watched it twice and that's hard for me to do, to watch anything twice because of my short attention span. Uh, but I thought it was just excellent and, uh, was happy to be a part of it. Quite frankly, it was, and hey, look, there's enough material on cutting room floor to do another episode or two, quite frankly. So I'm because sure. that mid South was just unique. Yeah. It was unique and it was in a unique part of the world. It was called a martial law, you know, wild west and all those cliches. So, uh, it was good. Those guys, everybody involved did a great job in, in putting that together. And that's another one I would go out of my way to, to take a look at, you know, go back and find it. However they find it. I don't know how you do that, but nonetheless, I'd sure as hell do that. I'd watch it again. If I, I, I probably will watch it again. So I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I'm glad you liked it. Loved it and uh, highly recommend that anyone who loves old school go out of their way to check it out. I think that was the last one for this season. Can't wait to see what those guys are up to next, whether it's Dark Side or more Tales from the Territories. Uh, I think we all agree they do a pretty good job in presenting these old stories that might not otherwise get the platform. Right. We're hoping to do that same sort of thing today for In Your House, Degeneration X. As a reminder, we're just one month removed from the Montreal screw job. And well, this is a different place now with Bret Hart out. And of course, uh, there were some, some other members of the Hart family who've been MIA, including Owen Hart. That's going to change here. 
This is headlined, not by Owen Hart, but by Shawn Michaels, who is the new world champion defending his title against Ken Shamrock, a guy that I have long felt, man, I could have pulled the trigger on him in 97, 98, and he could have been a top guy. And of course, you've cleared that up here on the program many times saying reliability was an issue. So as a result, this is, as far as I know, the only time that Ken Shamrock may have entered a WWF pay-per-view as a single. Um, what could have been, man, it feels like different time, different place. He could have yeah. been a top guy for y'all. Oh, he, I, I always looked at Kenny as a top guy. Uh, he was hard to manage a little bit, uh, in the beginning. Uh, he wasn't used to being on the road that many times that much. Uh, so he was, he was a great character to build around. I, I have a lot of respect for Kenny uh, and uh, tough guys. We know God almighty, you know, he was, he had, he had no problem navigating the locker room cause nobody gave him any shit. Uh, but he's, he was very underrated in my opinion and, uh, in the, in the pro wrestling world. So, but I think we may have missed an opportunity with him. No doubt. I thought I'm not, I'm with you. He, if Ken Shamrock had been the, had become the champion, let's say I had no problem with that. Believable, you know, his promos are believable because he didn't memorize his lines. So it was, it was some good stuff. So I'm a Ken Shamrock fan was then still am. Well, I know what else you're a fan of uh, clean balls. Oh man. Am I? I thought about that this morning too. <laughs> Tis the season for clean balls. Up, la, 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 la. Our friends at Manscaped are helping you clear your driveway for safe travels this holiday season from stocking stuffers to white elephants. Manscaped's products are at the top of every wish list. Grab some crop mops for your pops or the body buffer for the holiday lover. Win this year's white elephant gift and help all the men in your life go from eggnog to nice hog this December. By going to manscaped.com and using the code Jim Ross. Hey. 20% off plus free shipping. Manscaped is a one-stop shop for all your holiday needs. They got the perfect gift in the Platinum Package 4.0. Plus loads of little presents that are perfect for stocking stuffers. What better holiday gift than giving the gift of good hygiene and a few laughs. Manscaped's got you covered with liquid formulations. They got it all. Shampoos, body washes, gels, exfoliants, even upstairs and downstairs deodorant. Everything you need to keep it clean, Janine. And don't let their roast nuts, or their chestnut roast, easy for me to say, in the wrong boxers. Get them some uh, easy, breezy, beautiful Manscaped boxers. Uh, by the way, we can also knock out Dad's nasty-ass nose hairs with the Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer. We can get, get rid of those, uh, those Wolverine talons he's sporting, too, with the Shears 2.0. It's the full nail kit. Scissors, tweezers, even a file. I, I know the, the light, breezy, woodsy feel of the new preserved cologne is going to make you feel like an outdoorsman. Hey, if you're still using a loofah, dude, it's covered in bacteria from dead skin. Throw it out. Get the body buffer. It feels smoother, but it acts tougher. Speaking of tough, it's hard to beat the Lawnmower 4.0. It's the crown jewel for your family jewels. You ever cut your nut sack under a 4000K LED light? Probably not. You can now. And this bastard's waterproof. You want to go shaving up in the hot tub? Why not? Got skin safe technology. It's not going to let you cut your Santa sack. No nicks, no cuts. And by the way, if you've never gifted Manscaped, it's a hit. Let me just tell yeah. you. And Nobody you gave a present to last year even remembers what you got them. They'll remember this year, baby, if you get them Manscaped, because it'll be the most talked about gift under your old tree. I promise you. 100% agree. Or as our friend Tony would say, that's exactly right, JR. 20% <laughs> off and free shipping. The code Jim Ross at manscaped.com. That's 20% off y'all and free shipping at manscaped.com. Just use that code Jim Ross manscaped for a perfect gift. That will be this holiday's biggest hit. It'll be the talk of the tree, baby talk of the tree. It'll be the most oh. unique gift that you'll get. No doubt about that. And it's real and it does a service for you. You don't want your damn balls looking like those coconuts in the old grocery stores. Those long stringy <laughs> ass hairs. <laughs> Good Lord. I can only imagine that's what Shivani's nuts look like. Oh, that's, they as far as, that's as far as I want to go with that topic actually, but, uh, it's, it's really a, a good, it's just, it's just a great gift. It's funny. 
it's usable and then you, you can slip off to your room and do your trimming and then come back and surprise your significant other. All good stuff, man. Maybe with a little mistletoe belt action, you know, mistletoe belt buckle, one of my favorite things. Yeah. There you go. So if you were looking for something to get Jr. for Christmas, that's it. Let, let's move on. That's uh, it, let's talk about what's going on with the company here in 1997. Let's just pick it up with the, the day after the Montreal screw job, because the beat goes on after that pay-per-view, the survivor series, 1997. Now it's time to go do TV for Monday night Raw, And I imagine from the time the final bell airs at survivor series until we open the show for Monday night raw. That's gotta be one of the roughest 20 hour periods of your career. Probably. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say so. I'd safely say so. I don't think I slept that night on the mm. phone talking to guys, you know, I remember Mick Foley stands out as someone that uh, needed to needed to share his feelings with, and I think Mick went home for a day. He did. And that's a, that's a pretty good excursion because he lived, he, he didn't live in Canada and that's where we were. So Mick flew home for a day. I never really understood that. He was traumatized. <clears throat> Pardon me, I guess. Uh, and Mick's a very sensitive guy, <clears throat> the kind of guy you want in your locker room. Good human being, still a good human being, by the way. Uh, but yeah, it was tough. And, uh, it, because here's the thing about sleeping. I didn't know. I had no idea what to expect when we got to work the next day because everybody's not going to call me. Uh, but everybody talked to me when we got to television, what, we, what are you going to do? It was just, you know, here's the deal. It was like, what are you going to do about it? Jr. Well, I, I can't do anything about it. I can't resurrect this issue. I can't make your, the Bret Hart fans happy. Not after what happened. So it was, uh, it was really, uh, a, a, a tumultuous time unsettling. Uh, it just was just the worst of worst, uh, to see what happened. And, you know, I was, I was a big Bret Hart fan and I still am. And I was then I didn't, even though I didn't talk to him for seemingly years, it seemed like, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad it was over. I'm glad we got past it to some degree, even though, even though we're still talking about it 25 years later, wherever the hell it is. It's a, uh, it's a fun topic to uh, discuss and we've beat it up and approached it from every possible angle, but we all know when the Montreal screw job is done, we have a new world champion in Shawn Michaels, uh, Mick Foley's walking out. We got a room full of guys pissed off at Vince. Vince has a black eye and he's hobbling around. And I imagine that everyone was glued to nitro. It started just ahead of Monday night. Raw raw starts at 9 PM nitro starts at 8 PM. And I imagine that the quote unquote office here from the WWF was tuned in nitro opens with Bischoff announcing that Bret Hart has signed with the NWO and even mean Gene talks about how Brett punched out a prominent official. You can get the full story on the uh, hotline, but this is even though, uh, I think the contract stated that he still had time left on his deal. That was the narrative that Vince was pushing. Oh, what if Bret Hart just shows up on nitro tomorrow night with the world title? Well, he didn't show up. He didn't bring the world title, but they darn sure announced that Bret Hart was coming. what did you think as you saw that those first few minutes of nitro, or, or did you get a chance to see him before you started the program? I did not. I did not, uh, uh get a chance to see it. Uh, I was, you know, you're just busy pre-show stuff and. And we, we may still have been going over TV. We still may not have had a, a complete format. Hell, I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, but we're generally very busy pre show time. So I did not see it. I saw it later. Yeah. I thought it was a way to start the show. Quite, if I was those guys, Eric and his team, I was, that's how I would have done it. Go right to the number one story. You lead, you, you lead with the best stuff you got. And that was the biggest newsmaker of all. And, uh, so I, I thought it was. I thought it was spot on for those guys. Of course, when the, uh, the ratings come in, curiosity killed the cat. As they like to say, the WWF drew one of its best ratings since the early days of the Monday night war doing a 3.39 rating, still not enough to beat nitro, which does a phenomenal 4.3 rating, but the show opens with Shawn Michaels and yes, he's carrying the world title. And he says that 
he beat the man in his own country with his own hold and ran him out of the WWF to those old dinosaurs down South. And he couldn't resist saying how, after the show, Brett was so upset that he lost, he beat up a 52 year old man. We're, uh, we're having some fun creatively here, but with the content of this sort of thing, are you nervous from a talent relations standpoint that this creative might actually make the way the guys really feel worse, or is that not even a consideration? Oh, I don't know how big consideration would be Conrad, to be honest with you. It, uh, cause things pass and, and guys get over it. Uh, but you know, you're always concerned about how your talents are going to be responding to any traumatic situation. And that was certainly traumatic. And Brett had his followers and that were still in the WWE locker room. So, you know, it was just, a uh, awkward, very awkward might be the best way of putting it. Was it a tragedy? I don't think it was a tragedy it was Brett signed a hell of a contract and was going to make a lot of money. And I was all for that for him. But, uh, it was, a, it was one of those days where you hope that you don't re- live, have to live through another, uh, scenario involving everything that was based and rooted in Montreal. Uh, we're still riding that horse. It seems like, uh, as we move forward, I, um, I can't help, but wonder what was discussed and what wasn't discussed before you did Monday night raw, because we never say screw job. We never acknowledge what really happened, but we do run a commercial for the Tuesday replay in this era. They would run the the pay-per-views as a first run on Sunday. We'd have Monday night raw and we would say, Hey, don't forget to catch the replay tomorrow night on pay-per-view. And when we do that, we see footage of Bret Hart spitting on Vince and Brett throwing monitors down and destroying the ringside monitors for the commentary tables that didn't make the pay-per-view, but we're certainly showing the aftermath here. And we would get Jerry Lawler sort of casually mentioning the $3 million contract. And that would get some you sold out chance going from some of these WWF diehard fans. And Meltzer even said that you had never used this phrase before. But multiple times at the pay-per-view on Sunday and Monday night raw, you started to refer to Brett as a 21 year veteran, which Meltzer would freestyle was perhaps a subtle acknowledgement of how old Bret Hart was. Oh God. But he points out that you had never said it before. And when I read that, I thought, I don't think there's any way that Jr. did that to sort of That's diminish me. Bret Hart. Yeah. There you go. As they look at her story and, and, and that's what he, that's what he does for a living. So yeah, yeah, it was, but I, I, uh, I didn't do anything. I didn't go out of my way to do anything to upset, you know, to make it worse. At least I tried not to, but I was in a tough spot, uh, be honest with you. So yeah, it was, it was, a it was challenging. It was a challenging day that, that whole loop, that whole Canadian loop following Montreal was just, was just horrible. It's just horrible. Just so much pressure and, and ta- talents or didn't know what was going to happen next. And how's this going to affect us? And that's really their, their main issue is that how is this going to affect my money and my, yeah. my push? So as benevolent as some of the talents wanted to sound like they also, the guys that had the ability to work on top in main events, in other words, uh, they, they, they just were golly, just, it was just it was a, it was a slaughterhouse and this, you know, and I, I believe that, you know, that sounded like a turd, uh, that the talents were more concerned about themselves than they were about Brett's welfare. That's just the way I looked at it. it. It leaves a gaping hole on Monday night raw without the heart foundation. They had been such a big part of this program and now without them and without Mick Foley. It gives an opportunity to show the, the new heel, Mark Mero, the new heel gold dust Kurgan, the interrogator. And, uh, I guess we're going to highlight really for the first time, the new age outlaws, and they're going to start to become a more prominent piece here because just like in traditional sports, if somebody goes down with an injury, well, it creates an opportunity for some other folks. So every time, every time Conrad, it, it created opportunities for a lot of guys, some deserving, some were ready. Some were not, but this is the hand that, uh, and remember who's dealing the cards here. 
Mr. McMahon's dealing the cards and, uh, uh you know, more, more could be said about that, but that's really the bottom line. Vince is reshuffling the deck. And I've always believed in, in reshuffling the deck. I, I said this many times, wrestling fans, <clears throat> pardon me, love new and they love surprises. And this is all serious. <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> new. Sorry. Uh, no, all good, man. Hey, it's awful early in the morning. I want to wring your neck about this Jeff Jarrett interview because you're going to do a sit down interview with him. This had become popular in 1997. We saw you doing with Foley. We saw you doing with gold dust. Now you're doing one here with Jeff Jarrett who had just jumped ship the, in October. And, uh, now he's a part of the WWF, but that first interview he did, uh, with his jacket in the center of the ring, there was the promo that really got, uh, got Austin a little upset where he talked about 316 and how it was blasphemous. And he's even going to discuss some of that here in the interview with you, where he's talking about why he left WCW, why he made the jump. Were you aware that Austin was upset? Was that apparent right away? Was that something he would have discussed with you? I can uh, tell you that I probably knew Steve better than anybody in the company. And I still believe that to be true. It, I, I understood Steve's, uh, mindset better than most, uh, because he shared his, he shared his thoughts with me, uh, off the record more often than not, but I, I knew that, uh, for whatever reason, I think it may have just emanated in how Austin was booked in Memphis back in the day. I don't know. I suspect that had a play in it, but, uh, it was just, uh, I think there's latent things going on. I think there were things that were still going on in Steve's mind, replaying what happened back in the day when he was relegated eating potatoes and, and making, you know, uh, a couple of hundred bucks a week. But, uh, so I think there, it goes back longer than the Montreal and back longer than the promo that was done, uh, at least in my opinion. So it was, but nonetheless, it was uncomfortable and Austin had no problem expressing himself. He had all the power. He was a top guy. And, uh, I don't know if Jeff knew exactly what he was doing, uh, how that worked out, but. Nonetheless, he flew with it. You got to give him credit for that because he was taking a chance and that chance did not pay off for Jeff. Jeff didn't get that big run with Austin. If you noticed ever, no, he did not. ever. So anyway, it was another, another notch in the gun. Another stone was thrown and Austin at that time was not the guy you wanted to trifle with because he's not going to, he, Vince is not going to allow Austin's mi a mindset, uh, to affect him. He's just not, he just wasn't going to, wasn't going to have any effect. And it really didn't other than piss Steve off. Maybe some of the stuff that was happening backstage and the dialogue backstage was even more scintillating than not. But in any event, it was there. I'd forgotten about that promo. This sounds bad for Jeff, but I forgot one of his biggest promos ever, <coughs> but he was, a. Uh, he, he, he had the nuts to do it. Slap nuts. We, uh, we know that the interview, the sit down you did with Jeff was supposed to air a week prior. It was cut for time. It happens here. And about two minutes in, he's talking about how he should be the champion. And of course we know he is going to become world champion when he leaves this promotion and jump ship to WCW. And boy, I hate to talk about talent this way, but I do know that occasionally you guys, if you're running a roster and you're trying to make a program and tell stories, you've probably got to have a list of heels on one side of the paper and a list of baby faces on the other. And sometimes there is a pecking order. This is our top guy. He's our John Cena. He's our stone cold or what have you. And I've always imagined that sometimes maybe when Vince sees you at a certain level, that's kind of where you're at. I guess what I wanted to ask here is, do you think Vince McMahon ever saw Jeff Jarrett as a, a, a world champion level talent with the promotion or no, I don't think so. I think Jeff was a, uh, I use baseball analogy. Sometimes Jeff was, you know, that sounding disrespectful to Jeff. He was a, he was a good middle infielder. He was a good middle of the order uh, hitter, but he was not, uh, in Vince's eyes, in my opinion, that's all Vince didn't tell me this. But the way Vince tr treated him and, and uh, how Vince reacted to Austin's discomfort, uh, told me that there's nothing in the world Vince is going to do to, uh, you know, 
uh, upset Austin any more than he already was pissed off. It didn't take a lot to piss off Austin. He had a way of doing things. He had, a, he had something he believed worked and, uh, he wasn't going to let Jeff Jarrett or anybody else for that matter, uh, stand between him and, and, and his, his career and his greatness. I, uh, I got to point out that, you know, most of the time or not most of the time, but a lot of the time guys would win the intercontinental title on the way to winning the world title, whether it was Bret Hart or it was stone cold, or it was Shawn Michaels. Jeff was the intercontinental champion over and over and over. Never quite got to the world title though, in the WWF that would happen for him over in WCW. And we do see, and this is the first time we're really positioning the rock. And then he's really just Rocky Maivia still against Steve Austin, the new intercontinental champion. No one really knew at the time that this is going to be a feud that people are going to talk about for decades, but the first time they're in the ring with each other. And again, rock is younger to the biz than, than stone cold is, but this is still 1997 stone cold's not yet the world champ. Could you tell right away there's chemistry? Oh yeah. yeah. Rock and Steve had great respect for each other. And, uh, and Steve being a, you know, kind of a booker type personality knew the matches that he could have with rock or what could be absolutely, uh, amazing. And they were, and what's, what, what determines an amazing match, the money you draw, the money you get, you generate the new money, the cash. And because quite frankly, that's all Austin cared about was cash. And if you're smart in pro wrestling. That will always be your goal. The, uh, the goal here is to, uh, prove to the world one night after the screw job that Shawn Michaels is willing to lose. So the main event is Ken Shamrock versus triple H. And I know what you're thinking. What does it have to do with Shawn Michaels? Well, Shamrock pins Sean. Yes. He's not in the match. But we want to prove, I guess maybe this is a, a, a point by the writing team or Vince specifically, Sean will lose matches, just not to Brett. He'll even lose matches. He's not in Ken Shamrock pins him here. Yeah. Um, and then you get on the hotline and do nothing but praise Bret Hart for all of his work. And, uh, Meltzer would say, quote, even to the point of saying that he himself being right there, never heard a submission, but that the referee claimed he heard it. You're in a weird spot here where you're trying to please the chairman, not piss off the talent, be respectful of Brett and tell a story to the audience. It's a lot of spinning plates. You're, uh, you're keeping in the air here, Jim. That's a good, that's a good way of looking at it. Spinning plates. Uh, it's better than being the clown at the circus, I guess, but, uh, yeah. it's, it's in that conversation. So yeah, it's again, it, 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 Conrad just kept going on and on. Every day, another chapter, Montreal relived. This was, this, it just got to be so old and so unnecessary, especially when you got talents, <clears throat> excuse me, coming to you, to me wanting answers. And, you know, you feel very helpless that you can't give your talent the answers that they're looking for because you don't have them. I don't, I didn't know the answers, uh, but I do know that uh, the benevolency of talents, uh, we're, you know, I don't know how many guys step forward like Mick, not many. They're more concerned about their spot and their money and where they are going in their career. And it's not changed. It's not going to change with the guys who are more concerned. And maybe they're, that's, maybe that's the right agenda. Hell, I don't know, but, uh, that's kind of where, where I see this whole matter. It's more about the talents themselves than, uh, than not. Let's, uh, let's point out something that I don't think a lot of people have heard before. Bret Hart picks up the phone and calls Dave Meltzer and says, hear what was supposed to happen. Quote, after survivor series, the next night on raw, Jim Ross would interview Hart and point blank, ask him the question about leaving using the Canadian newspaper clippings on the screen and Hart would reluctantly, or maybe not reluctantly admit that he was going to WCW. Hart would then say he was going to remain in the WWF until the end of the month and work his final shows in the various arenas and his very last match 
would be the December 7th pay-per-view show in Springfield. They would push the fact that as a way to build up a big buy rate for a traditionally weak December pay-per-view show, Brett would say on his interview that he would defend the title against anyone in Springfield and wanted to leave the WWF with his head up and still the champion. And since he's doing the interview in Ottawa, where he's still the top baby face crowd would respond to that. At that point, slaughter would announce the final four match with Bret Hart, the undertaker, Ken Shamrock and Shawn Michaels where Brett would act as if he had been double crossed by the Americans again and put in a situation where he didn't have to lose the fall in order to lose the title. So that's the way it was originally pitched to Brett, according to Brett and his report to Dave Meltzer. Had you heard of that? Like had the screw job not happened, is that what you believed was going to happen? The direction? I thought the match was going to end in a disqualification and, uh, Obviously, as we as it played out, that was not to be. So uh, there's a lot. There's a million stories in the Naked City. Yeah, you can Google that, kids. Almost immediately, there's talk of Bulldog and Owen Hart wanting out and wanting to leave the company. Why do you think Bulldog was okay, or, or Vince was okay with Bulldog buying out his contract, but he was so keen on keeping Owen? Well, <laughs> Bulldog was a little bit more high maintenance. And he had some issues as we have discussed here, not to speak ill of the dead, but, uh, Davey needed some help. Owen did not, uh, Owen was reliable and, uh, he was, like I said, low maintenance and, uh, and everybody loved Owen. He could work with anybody tags or singles or whatever you wanted to say. So they're two different talents entirely. And to judge one as you would judge the other would not be fair to Owen, quite frankly. And, uh, and Owen didn't, Hey, Owen didn't want to leave WWE. Right. He he'd left because of what he perceived to be a family obligation and show family support. And, and to be honest with you, it put Owen in a real tough spot. So I'm glad they worked all that out and Owen came back and, and you know, well, we all loved Owen. We still love Owen. I'm so happy that, uh, AEW has a relationship, a positive professional relationship with Martha Hart and her family. Uh, that's well overdue. And so I'm sure glad that we, that's been addressed and, uh, and that we have a relationship with those guys that, uh, we're proud of proud to have that relationship. Meltzer would write this Owen Hart was talked into working the November 12th show in Ontario en route to a meeting in Connecticut the next day with McMahon. Owen wanted some sort of an apology as McMahon later showed on raw a few days later, he has his own mind worked out that all the problems were Brett's fault and wouldn't do so. Hart left the meeting and went home and was removed from all the house show bookings. McMahon and Owen had a second meeting. On the 16th, again, not reaching a satisfactory ending. The Titan position on the matter is that Hart is taking a, hi- a hiatus to work everything out due to the family situation. Others portray it as Owen being given a deadline, either January 1st or perhaps December 1st, depending on the source, to return to work. And he has until that time to work everything out since the company realizes he is in a bad position and in no way is he at fault. The bottom line is that both Owen Hart and Smith have families and can't work elsewhere and whether they would like to leave or not, ultimately they don't seem to have much of a choice. Are you in either one of these meetings with Owen and Vince? Yeah. What do you remember about these? Well, they got personal and, uh, Owen was, <clears throat> as I said earlier, oh, this was a big pain in the ass for Owen as well. He got caught in the middle of a lot of this, this stuff. So, uh, but the meetings are civil. It, it comes down to cash and creative Conrad, the same old shit, man, yeah. same stuff. So, uh, that's how I, I remember it. Uh, it, it came down to cash and creative. Number one, you can't put Owen in a situation creatively that, uh, he can't flourish in because he's that good a talent. And then the other matter was of course money. And Owen was known to be very frugal, uh, saved his money. Uh, prepared, kept preparing for the future. 
because he had told me many times he didn't want to do this forever. Right. And that wasn't because of Brett. Mm -hmm. That was because of how Owen felt about being spending time with his family. And so, uh, but the meetings never got mean spirited. I don't think it didn't seem to me that they were mean spirited. There's just simply business meetings where that personal element sprinkled in like you would have some good JR seasoning. It made everything better. It just it sprinkled it in and it, and it worked out pretty good. So, uh, I'm, uh, I'm just glad we got it worked out. Owen, having Owen Hart in your locker room makes your locker room stronger and better. And I think that's kind of what, that's how I was looking for wins, Conrad. I wasn't looking to get my hand raised. I was just looking to get wins for the company. And I think Owen coming back and signing and getting a nice raise was, uh, was, was that, I think we, I think we were successful in that situation, but the road to get there was, was hell. No doubt. Well, before we talk about the contract, I want to talk about the next Monday night raw. So of course we've got now the, the Monday after Montreal behind us, but one week later we're promoting a Vince McMahon interview. It's a sit down interview this time. It's not gold dust and it's not Mick Foley. It's you and Vince McMahon. And it's the infamous why Brett, why, and it's even marketed as the untold story. And you're given the task of, of, of hosting this interview with Vince. Were you giving the questions? Like, t- tell us how that all comes to be. Do they say, all right, you say this, then I'll say that. Or yeah, no, Vince is not, it, Vince doesn't work that way real well. And I don't either at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was a list of questions that I was provided to put into the context of this interview. And, uh, I, I, I don't know, man, it's just, uh, those are harder to remember. Uh, but it was hard, it was heavily produced and, you know, Vince wanted to make sure that every word was tangible. Every word was, uh, exactly what he wanted to say, uh, cause he had points he wanted to make and he was trying to save face, I think in, in a large extent. Uh, so, but we, we had a, it was a, it was a decent interview. I don't remember all the highs and lows of it, uh, other than it was, you know, something Vince wanted to do. He was very hell bent on it. And, uh, you know, he could, I, I, for all I could care, he could use Michael Cole in that interview. Michael Cole's a great interviewer still is. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, man. I, I, it came and went, Vince got off his chest. He addressed the matter and off we went to, to try to jumpstart this, this, uh, train wreck. Well, let's talk about the, the thing that everybody remembers most of all from that interview, the phrase Brett screwed Brett. Yeah. Did, I mean, did you know going into that, that will be the takeaway or was it just organic and it just happened? No, it was organic. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't have Vince's lines. Right. I didn't have, okay, you say this, I'll say that. Cause neither one of us are comfortable in that deal. And plus it would have sounded so contrived Yes. and so, uh, fake phony and Vince did not want that. He wanted it to be it from his perspective, uh, his side of the story. So I, uh, I, I remember it very well. I was nervous. It was, uh, cause I was in uncharted waters. I was on the, I was in the deep end of the pool. I'm not, and I'm not a great swimmer but we made it through it. And, and, uh, so I guess that's part of my legacy is that that interview was one of the more significant pieces of creative business that, that I had done. Did you think that the, the Brett screwed Brett thing was going to be as big as it was when you no. were finished? Okay. Uh, uh-uh, I didn't, it caught on. Yeah. It added fuel to the fire, if you will. So, uh, but again, it, the story just kept continuing. It's like, you want to say, for the love of God, can we just get past this shit? Right. Can we, can we finally somewhere move on? Are we selling tickets? Are we doing anything, you know, great creative? Uh, I don't, it didn't seem like it. It seemed like we, it's like, it's like, it's a difference in throwing a, a gallon of fuel on the fire or a, just a little bit. We poured a lot of, a lot on the fire. And I don't know that it, I don't know that that interview really helped Vince's side of the story or not. That's an individual, individual p- opinion. 
but I, I thought that, uh, I don't know how much, like I said, I don't know how much good Vince did for himself, uh, by doing the interview and especially coming up with that, uh, go home line, uh, or most, most memorable line of Brett screwed Brett. Well, let's talk about, you know, what we're seeing as we see a shot here, maybe you're watching with us on YouTube. Gosh, I hope you are. If you haven't already recommend to a friend that they go check it out. It's grilling Jr on youtube.com. That's grilling Jr on youtube.com. You can also watch live on ad free shows. Uh, we got it sold out hanging from the rafters in the chat right now, folks watching us do this program live. But as we're taking a look at the heel, Mr. McMahon, of course, that's still Vince McMahon, but this interview, a lot of people point to and say, that is the beginning of the Mr. McMahon character. And we know that he's going to become the hottest heel in the whole promotion. Oh, yeah. And, and the stuff he's going to make the music he's going to make with, uh, with Steve Austin, just one month later, starting with the whole DX thing and, and Mike Tyson thing. And then on through the year, I mean, it'll, that will eventually be the feud that puts WWE in the driver's seat of the Monday night wars Correct. after getting thumped week after week, after week, 83 oh, weeks, Conrad, 83 weeks, 83 weeks is on the ad freak shows.com. There you go. Jesus Christ. Would you shove, would you shove it right up my ass? Will you one more no. time? I will, um, <laughs> talk to me about you're sitting there across from him on camera. This is the birth of Mr. McMahon. Would you, could you imagine that this is in your mind's eye, this is Vince transitioning from being quote unquote, just an announcer to now he's the lead villain. Uh, well, I wasn't, I wasn't planning on it, I, I, but it worked. Thank God. Uh, Look, what you said earlier is accurate. I said it many times to myself, uh, Miss McMahon, Mr. McMahon, more specifically was the top heel in the attitude era. Yes. And that's not knocking triple H or or any other heels. No, uh, not at all. It was a fact that Vince was, it was a fresh character. It was new. It was material that we had not seen or heard, uh, from, uh, of, uh, until to that date. So it, it had all the elements necessary. We checked all the boxes and, uh, you know, the, the, I was never, I was never, I didn't, I was surprised that Vince was such a good heel. Uh, and he was, he was the best and, uh, and, and Vince McMahon helped make Steve Austin in this rivalry and this, uh, this, this thing. So, uh, at the end of the day, it was a win for WWE because McMahon's, uh, the height of his, his scenario, his, uh, this whole thing was, was extraordinary and we couldn't have created a better, a bigger, or better heel. Now we no. wanted to make more heels and we tried to make more heels and we did, but nothing compared to Vince. And I, and I also will say that, uh, you know, without leaving out Stephanie, uh, she contributed to that, uh, persona uh, very well. I mean, she is, if Vince was the number one heel as time went on, uh, Stephanie and triple H or maybe that one a and one B type thing, but it, it was a family deal. It was a family situation. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we got past it. And what it did was it helped make a lot of other people, you know, Vince's rub, you can go back and look, uh, it was just uh, astonishing of how many talents it touched and that's smart booking. Vince made sure that the right people got the right rub, uh, to make this thing work and to create a new perspective, a new uh, personas and new rubs. As I said, the rubs are very much un undervalued sometimes. And Vince has shared his rub very, very prominently, uh, with the wannabe heel superstars. It's amazing to me that I don't even know this was on purpose. Like when I take a look at that interview back, I feel like it's Vince trying to convince us, the audience that, Hey, I'm not the bad guy in this scenario. Look at my black eye. You know, Brett was very selfish. It feels as if Vince is trying to position himself as the baby face. He was, and I don't even think he realized at the moment I'm becoming a heel with this promo. It feels like a happy accident. You know, this Mr. McMahon character blowing up. It doesn't feel like part of a grandiose plan. Might not have been, but we didn't know how good it was going to be. Right. 
you know, we didn't realize that Vince is going to become a major superstar is on the heel side of the roster. I remember my booking sheets, uh, we had one sheet and it would have, uh, on one side, the baby faces, the other side, the heels to book you to use as uh, in, in a booking scenario. And then a miscellaneous column, uh, with, uh, you know, Vince prominently on that list. So he went from being the, the, just simply the, uh, chairman of the board to, uh, a new persona. It was a new character for me to play with. And we did it without Vince going to house shows to any degree whatsoever. Right. So it was, uh, it was a lot of surprises and some of them were good surprises. Like I said, when you can create and, and be involved in creating this, the top heel that you've ever had, you know, uh, it's hard to top that man. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, it's hard to top and that's Mr. McMahon, the evil Mr. McMahon. We're going to see that change happen from him just being an announcer to now being the lead villain. And if you're looking to make a change, can we recommend Lucy breakers? Well, this is an ad for Lucy breakers. Y'all get ready. Here's the reality. Lots of adults choose to use nicotine. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Now listen up. Not everyone uses nicotine. But if you do, you want to pay special attention to Lucy Breakers. If you're one of the millions of adults who use nicotine, you know that, well, not all products are created the same. And we think there's a new product that stands above the rest. Lucy Breakers are the only nicotine pouch that gives you a blast of flavor from the first moment to the last. Each pouch contains a capsule that you break open to release a rush of flavor. It doesn't fade away like those other pouches. You know, the ones that rhyme with thin. They come in so many flavors, mint, berry, citrus, mango, even espresso. And you don't have to go down to the gas station or corner store to get these. Just order them online and they'll be shipped straight to your door. By the way, every order, it's free shipping. That's good. Plus, if you subscribe, you'll save 15% and never run out. Here's a little pro tip for you. There's a fellow in the office that I know that... Uh, well, he had to get his fix outside in the cold weather. And I said, hey, man, might be a little better way. He tried Lucy Breakers. Now he's enjoying them at his desk. He's uh, weather averse now. Come on. Thanks to Lucy Breakers. So whether you use nicotine while working, creating, or playing, Lucy Breakers are the intelligent choice. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Get $10 off your first order when you use promo code JR at checkout. The shipping is always free. That's lucy.co, promo code JR, and receive $10 off and free shipping. Visit lucy.co for more details, and we thank Lucy for sponsoring the podcast. Now, here comes the fine print, y'all. Lucy products are only for adults of legal age, and every order is age verified. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. One more time, that's lucy.co. The promo code's JR. You'll get free shipping and 10 bucks off. How about that? How about Not a bad that deal whatsoever. You like I, need that help in, I need help in that regard. I can tell you, I'm going to try these Lucy breakers out myself. Can somebody just introduce me to Lucy? I'd like to meet a Lucy someday. Hey, man. And uh, I love Lucy and you will too. <laughs> Lucy breakers. Check it out. That's good. Uh, an hour before Raw goes on air on USA Network the next week. Rick Rude shows up on Nitro. Mm -hmm. He walks to the ring with the NWO. He shaved his beard. Now he's just got a mustache. This is uh, of note because Raw is a taped show, and he's going to appear on that program with a beard on the same day. And I think as Bruce Pritchard has explained on his podcast, Something to Wrestle, that Rude was just working a per night deal. He didn't have a traditional contract, so he was within his right to do this, but maybe you guys found out when you saw him on nitro. Is that the way it went down? Yeah, that was for me for sure. I can't speak for everybody, but it was for me. Yeah, I didn't, I, 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 I knew his deal was a, a, like a day labor, you know, he was per event type thing. Uh, but you know, it's hard to, it's hard to believe that we made such a big deal out of this for a guy that can't take bumps. Right. And so I, I was wondering, what did we lose? 
Nothing. You know, uh, Rick was a, uh, at one time, one of the biggest stars in wrestling, but he had that bad back and he couldn't take bumps uh, to any degree. So, uh, but that's the first time I heard about it. It was like, my God, did you see what just happened? You know? And, <laughs> but it was just another, here we go again. This, this the never ending story of uh, turmoil and intrigue and all that stuff. So I, I was just. God almighty, I just praying for the day that we could get past this shit. Before the show airs, we have a dark match on the, uh, the raw side of things. Adam Copeland is going to defeat Christian cage. I think it worked out for those fellows. What do you think? Yeah, they did. All right. We got to get Christian healthy, get him back in the roster and line up there at AEW. Uh, but, uh, these guys were just phenomenal. And, uh, you know, you knew how you knew they were going to be great. Seemed like Edge may have had the notch up advantage in that uh, debate of those two gentlemen, uh, but they're both vi- viable pieces to any uh, wrestling puzzle you wanted to deal with. So uh, they were keepers. They were keepers from the get go. We also want to remind everybody that this is the Raw where Austin would challenge Rock and the entire nation would attack the Rock and they're able to steal the title from Austin. Um, at this point, of course, we know we've got to get the intercontinental title off of Steve after the whole broken neck deal, uh, rock gets the, the nod here and man, magic is, is coming. It's in route. Yeah. Uh, Sean Michaels and company show up to do an interview and they end up insulting Sergeant slaughter, beating him up, burying him under the toilet paper. They, uh, stretch out the toilet paper to be an X here, like DX Rude, of course, is in the segment. Um, they can't edit it out. And in the commentary, which is done live, you can kind of tell they're joking about it. Cornette says something like, uh, he's the typical insurance salesman. And when it comes time, come time to collect on the policy, he's gone to Tahiti. I guess you, there's only so much you can do here, but, uh, tell us about that process of, Hey, it's a taped draw, but we're going to do the commentary live. How would you do that? Well, carefully, uh, quite frankly, and. From the studio, uh, were we in the studio? I, I'm just asking when you, I don't know, but if, if you taped her all and now you're going to do the commentary live, where would y'all do that from? Well, from the 120 Hamilton in Stanford. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because we want to keep the elements as much el- the elements of a live commentary feel as we could muster considering, uh, how, uh, the lay of the land was. So, uh. It was awkward, awkward to say the least. Uh, Mark Miro is going to come out and do an interview and he's going to call out Butterbean. and there's almost no pop when Butterbean hops the rail, they start shoving each other and it sets up Butterbean versus Mark Miro for the pay-per-view. And that's going to happen one day after Butterbean is actually in a traditional fight on the Oscar de la Hoya card. How does this Butterbean Mark Miro story come to be? And what was the relationship like with Butterbean? Are you the guy making that call or, or how does yeah. that work? Yeah, I called Bean. We were close, Connie. I called him Bean. <laughs> <laughs> Bean's a nice guy. He had a little barbecue place down there in Alabama someplace. Jasper. Is that where it was? Yep. Nice guy. Really a nice guy. Sweetheart of a fellow. Uh, but uh, don't you, it, it shows you that you cannot uh judge a book by its cover as the old cliche goes he'd knock your ass smooth out and that's what he did every time down for us he could beat everybody up and uh but nice fella really nice fella and but we he was bean was just getting he had a cult following and he 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 especially appealed to the male 18 to 49 year old demographic which is exactly what uh money not raw was primarily appealing to as well so, uh, all Bean was looking for was, was a payday. That's, and so, but he was building a reputation and a following. So we just felt like that was a, something we could pull off and we did pull it off pretty good. So, uh, but I like Butterbean. Get, it put Butterbean's, Butterbean's work in, in WWE was put Butterbean on the map and made him some good, good change, good money. And, uh, he's always fun to work with. Never a problem. 
Vader is supposed to wrestle Goldust, who shows up wearing pantyhose, says he's injured, and then hits Vader on the head with a hammer. This is uh maybe where we start to take this attitude era a little too far. What do you think about Goldust as he seemingly keeps raising the stakes on his silly dress and whatnot? I like Goldust as a persona. Uh, he pulled that gimmick off pretty good, I thought. Yeah. Uh, but it was so unique and so different. I, I wasn't sure that we were striking a chord or, or, or discord. So, uh, it was just, uh, but it's worth a chance. We're looking to get something hot. Yes. And, and I want to tell you, I, I always thought that Dustin, uh, who's got a real cool wrestling school. We talked about that the other day at, uh, TV. Uh, you know, he's got about, he always has a full class because he's a real good teacher. So, uh, I don't know how much longer he's going to wrestle he says not long and uh probably a good idea you know he's, his body's beat up and all those things so but i i enjoyed that character i i liked the the goldust character and what i really liked about it conrad was that uh dustin took ownership of that he added a lot to the creative of that uh, scenario and that character so i'm uh I'm still a big fan of his work and you know, I loved his dad and all that good stuff. And, uh, but the Goldust character was uh, a winner in, in my view. Sometimes we are prone to take a drastic approach in hopes of getting something over. And I, I found it to be, uh, a situation where the homophobia is a gorgeous George type scenario. Gorgeous George got over because gorgeous George but was playing the role of a gay person, or at least that's what we thought. And so it was, it was, uh, interesting. I, I like gold dust. I like the character, the persona, persona, persona of it. Uh, but you know, he was just, sometimes you let talents get talent. Sometimes just go a little crazy and they get, get, get out there and they're, but they're told to get out there, come cre- help us create this character that you're portraying. And I thought that, uh, Dustin did a hell of a job of adding to that, because again, we're in a new territory here as far as this character is concerned. And it did remind me of gorgeous George. Uh, it did remind me of exotic Adrian street, just the, 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 the homophobia of that whole scenario, uh, was, uh, pretty damn amazing. It was, and I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, it's changed now. I don't know if it even worked now, but back then I thought it worked real well. No doubt it, uh, it's an interesting time in the company. It feels like a company in transition and we're trying new things with Butterbean and some of the crazy over the top presentations that the artist formerly known as Goldust is going to share with us, but we still sprinkle in a little nostalgia here where we see Sergeant Slaughter doing an interview saying he's going to wrestle on the pay-per-view and he's going to take on triple H of course, back then Hunter Hearst Helmsley. I don't think a lot of fans would have called this a return to the ring, even as a one-off for Sergeant Slaughter. What'd you think of that creative? And, uh, was this something that Sarge was looking forward to? Well, I think Sarge, like any former major star was looking to get that one more big payday, uh, and see what's left in the tank. Uh, and, and I admire that because it's scary. People are expecting the old Sarge and he's a lot older than he was the last time you saw him, so to speak. So, uh, but Sarge deserved that opportunity. I thought there's no better person for pro wrestling than Bob Slaughter, Bob Remus. And, uh, you know, we became very close. We shared a room for on the road off and on, uh, in, in mid South. And I, I always had great respect for Bob and I still do. And, uh, I helped save his life one time. Did you know that story? No. Yeah. We were in Stanford at the ho- at the hotel we used there. And, uh, um, we're, we have a nice talk and shooting a breeze. And I, I, he, he walks, he leaves and walks away and he gets to the elevator and passes out. So I ran over there and, and got him flat and, uh, you know, talked him through his seizure. I guess it was a seizure, but he had a, uh, he had a, uh, you know, just a, a spell as my granny would say, and he lost consciousness 
and I wasn't so sure he was going to make it. I didn't know if he had a heart attack or what, but we called an ambulance and we got the, the EMTs there quick because we we're downtown Stanford, didn't have far to travel. And, uh, so we had to kind of nurture him back to life. And I'm glad I got to be help, help a little bit on that matter because I was the closest to Bob to, uh, you know, uh, physically, I saw what happened and I was the first one on the scene and I got him out of the elevator. He, he was kind of laying across the elevator where the door wouldn't shut. So I, I did the mistake. I, I, I pulled him out and then, uh, we had somebody call nine one one. And, uh, so the, the, uh, EMTs are there quickly and, uh, Osarge kicked out as he, as he did so many matches. So, uh, I always had a great closeness to Bob Slaughter, uh, and the real name, Bob Remus. So, uh, but he was a, he was a good dude. He's the guy that introduced me to Chinese food. Uh, we had a Chinese buffet that we would just destroy about once a week, once or twice a week. <laughs> it was kind of, so I, I had, uh, I, I got an education on Chinese food from Sergeant Slaughter and I still love it today. I, uh, man, I love hearing these old stories. I, uh, I, I want to mention this, this first Monday night or this first Madison square garden, rather, uh, show that you do post screw job, the Brooklyn brawler had won a battle Royal earlier in the year, almost as a rib saying he got a future title shot. So they'll pay that off against Shawn Michaels, but on the same show, we get undertaker teaming with Steve Austin to beat Shawn Michaels and triple H. And this is really the first time that Austin works most of the match or more of a match since the injury, he works about a third of this match here after the match, he even hits uh, the stunner on China. The fans are none too happy. First of all, because DX really knows how to get the fans fired up and they know how to be heels, but there's just a ton of debris coming into the ring. But Meltzer would even say he thinks that perhaps some of that debris is because these fans in New York at MSG, they're upset about what's happened with Brett. Do you remember this night? It was a house show. It was non-televised, but I know that Vince really values the opinion of the garden. Oh yeah. The garden was kind of the benchmark, how things got over or getting over or might be over whatever the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the situation was the garden was the measuring stick. Let's say it that way. And, uh, a lot of things are tried in the garden. If it worked in the garden, it's going to work anywhere. I think that was the bottom line of what we're trying to say here. And so the garden was, uh, like I said, the benchmark, if it has to work in the garden, if it didn't work in the garden, then you go back, you take your pencil out and you use the eraser and you rebook it. So that's kind of where I see that whole garden thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming even with Vince out of the picture now that that's still, uh, a, a consistent element, things that happen at a house show in the garden still carry weight and uh, means something special. And I don't know if that's just the garden it is the, it's the world's most famous arena, you know, as we all know. So I, I, uh, I, 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 I like that. I like to have a benchmark, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma territory, uh, new Orleans was the benchmark and cowboy would book around new Orleans and the big shows would be in new Orleans. So, uh, it was, it was, uh, every, every territory had their town that the angles that were being booked had to draw in, uh, it was important. So I'd say that the garden was that, that test kitchen. Then you guys do something fairly creative. It's uh Monday night raw, November 24th, Fayetteville, North Carolina. And the entire show of Monday night raw here is built around Bret Hart. We're going to tease that the main event is going to be Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels. When I was teasing that on the show, we even run ads in the USA today. And technically Bret is still under contract to the company, but they opened the show with Shawn Michaels claiming he had a secret conversation with Bret unbeknownst to everyone else, including McMahon. And he used the term as God is my witness. And he talked about the internet He's broken in half. No, that's another, that's another guy. <laughs> yeah. Another guy. <laughs> He's going to say the word internet and underground dirt sheet and 
he's going to try to blur the lines a little bit. And then we actually see a white limo being shown several times throughout the remainder of the hour. And you and Jim Cornette are trying to sell that. Well, I guess that's Bret Hart. And of course we know the rest of the story. Out comes a little person dressed in a leather jacket and sunglasses. They're pretending as if this little person is Bret Hart. Shawn Michaels puts him in a sharpshooter. Hunter's on the microphone. Ah, this yeah. is, uh, yeah. 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 What else? What is there to say about this? Nothing. Can we just frigging move on for God's sakes? You yeah. can see Harvey Whippleman there dressed up like Rick Rude. I mean, listen, they're having fun. This is classic Degeneration X, but it is sort of continuing to throw fuel on the fire of. Hey, we, we fucked one of our top guys and we're not even bashful about it. All right. No, no shame. No shame. No, no shame whatsoever. Use whatever you got at your fingertips to, uh, it, accentuate your side of the story. Uh, our, our, our ratings is what is, that was about ratings and it, it, and the minute by minutes and I had all this stuff play out and all this other crap. So, uh. But, you know, at some point in time, you know, in my role, you just kind of get, you roll with the punches because that's basically all you got to go on. I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't involved in the television writing. Thank God. He would ask me things every now and then. What do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? And I would give him a truthful answer to, as, to the best of my ability, but I didn't know I wasn't involved in those, uh, those creative meetings. Thank God that may have tipped the scale for me. If I was required to come up with storylines all involving this one topic. I don't know that I could have done it because I was so turned off by all that stuff. It just wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. And I always believe, I still believe to this very day that pro wrestling should be about fun. So anyway, it's, it was, uh, you, you kept looking for another day at the office type scenario. And I, it's hard to find that sometimes in that environment at that time. Well, they put a WCW sign on his butt, kick him in the butt and say, there's no room for you go down there with the rest of the garbage. I mean, listen, we're, 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 if we want to make Shawn Michaels a heel, he is, but Meltzer is clearly pretty critical of this saying the match they need to be hyping is Shawn Michaels versus Ken Shamrock. And how did anything on that television show result in the feeling in your gut that you can't wait to see Shawn Michaels versus kid Shamrock. No, you waited to see a match. The company can't deliver. In this case, the skit was done with the idea of humiliating someone who signed with the opposition, but if anything, it backfired only making Hart even more of a focal point than when he actually held the title. And that's kind of hard to argue from Dave here, you know, uh, as they say in wrestling, where's the money? Well, where's the money in this? Like we're supposed to be working towards our next big pay-per-view. Sean should be ridiculing Ken Shamrock, not Bret Hart. Right? Yeah, no doubt. It's, it was back Ashford booking. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know that Sean and all those guys are, uh, I mean, once they saw their direction, Vince wanted to go, I think that they were, you know, they were comfortable going that direction, but it was just not good. Connie, it was just not good. Good TV. Uh, the, it, it continued to confuse the audience in my opinion. And, uh, I know for those of us that were on the inside, uh, we were tired of it. And I think the audience, how many times can you do these things? Uh, it just didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. The audience was confused. They were disillusioned. It was like saying, we want something new and something what's next. Just tell me what's next. And sometimes you got the answer and sometimes you didn't. Well, let's talk about this. Uh, Jim Neidhart apparently is under a similar deal to Rick rude. He's not under a traditional contract. It's a per shot deal. So I guess he can leave at any time. So just to make sure that we've covered all of our bases, since we know what happened with Rick rude, we're going to have him try to join DX. We're going to kick his ass, humiliate him, bury him. And then if he shows up next week, nah, that's okay. Um, Jim, poor Jim Neidhart. He's just sort of caught in the middle here. Is he not? Yeah. Yeah. He's no win situation. God bless him. I like Jimmy. He was a good guy. 
he's the guy that Cowboy brought in the Mid South back in his uh, in Nightheart's rookie year to teach uh, uh, Cowboy's son Micah how to shot put, and because uh, Nightheart was a world class shot putter, and he was giving personal coaching to uh, to Bill's son Micah, and not Eric but Micah, and uh, so tough scenario to be in and but bill treated nightheart good it wasn't this it wasn't this atmosphere this era so but you knew something was up something was coming because i mean nightheart and brett were brothers-in-law right and 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 they're gonna they're gonna hang together and why wouldn't they hang together let's uh let's also remind everybody this is the the monday night raw where the new age outlaws essentially get the torch passed to them by the legion of doom they become the tag champs for the very first time and then they sprint out of the ring uh, after winning the uh, the tag titles and jump into a car where the keys are already in it and speed away, which Meltzer says is another spoof of how Earl Hebner left the Molson Center. Oh man, we just can't help ourselves. I, I you know when I think sometimes we as quote unquote content creators get criticized for talking about the screw job so often. But man, the WWF, they were not shameless in it. I mean, they would not only beat you over the head with it, they would give you these little hints of things and little callbacks like, uh, the leaving in the speeding car and whatnot. See, WWF- I didn't get that. I didn't get that. What you just said. Yeah. Like, like uh, Earl, the Hebners. Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't, ta- I didn't connect those dots. Yeah. But it makes for a good story. Goldust comes out in a wheelchair on Monday night raw here. And he announces to the audience. He's now a quadriplegic and he has a nurse with him who he calls nurse. Good body. Vader comes out says he didn't believe it. He attacks Goldust and the nurse who turns out to be Luna Vachon who threw alcohol in his eyes. It took two tries because she missed the first time injuring his eye. And he's going to wear an eye patch for his match in the main event later in the show. Vader in an eye patch. We're trying all kinds of silly shit here. Is this, is this all the, th- from the mind of Vince Russo? Or do you think Dustin's a big collaborator in this? Well, I'm sure Dustin, Dustin cooperated with the, with the collaboration because it meant he got more TV time and, and, and had a higher place on the, on the card creatively. Uh, but it was weak. It's just simply that it's just weak. And, uh, I thought it, we just kept digging a hole, a hole too, too far. And did the ratings indicate that we were, were kicking ass and doing great. I don't think so. No, you're not. You're still losing. Yeah. Yeah. One of the more iconic and memorable moments from Monday night raw in this era is going to have the rock doing an interview. The lights and the microphone will start flickering on and off with the idea being that Austin is uh, in the control room messing with him. He comes through the crowd and Austin tells him if his beeper says three sixteen, it's his ass. Rock's beeper goes off as Austin comes in the ring. Rock's eyes get real big. And now here we go. This is also the first time in promo we would hear the rock refer to himself as the rock and the people's champion early beginnings of what's going to become not only the top act in the promotion, but in the country and maybe of all time, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was watching a young rock last week and they had the, ep- one of the episodes, uh, focusing on, uh, this time period, uh, and, uh, how important, uh, an event in Chicago was for rock's career. And, uh, it was really well done. So I don't know how many people watch, uh, young rock. I encourage you to, because it's very entertaining. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's fun to watch. They had some fat guy playing me. Uh, you see that guy? I did. Uh, they could have had me. <laughs> I'd have done it. Just pay me. No, I'm kidding. I, <laughs> I would have done it for rock with, for no cost because I love the guy. Uh, but they, they at least, uh, wrote the, what they perceive the image to be for the love of God. That they got some poor bastard to play Jr. who didn't have any lines. It's almost like the real thing. Uh, but at least I was on camera. When's the last time you saw me on camera on on right rampage? Exactly. Forever. So 
are we doing TV? We just do radio. So anyway, uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I don't know what to say about that deal. Uh, we kept trying and trying it's just do, do basic pro wrestling. And you had, and, and we finally got to it. And when we got to it, it was huge. The, it was huge meeting rock and Austin. Finally, the bullshit has passed us a little bit. And now we can go about our business of entertaining the real pro wrestling fan. And that's what I think we were, we were a little late to the supper table on that one, but nonetheless, we finally got there. Just so you know, Jim, when they had you on uh, quote unquote, you, your character on yeah. young rock, mm-hmm. I took a screenshot and I posted it to Twitter and I said, sure y'all, you did. y'all did my man dirty here <laughs> and, and friend of the show, Brian Gortz quote tweeted it and said off airpoint Conrad, but that's not your man. That's a nice fellow who worked in the building who happened to fit the mold for what was needed that day. We're lucky enough to cast the great Jim Ross on hashtag young rock. I promise no one will be done dirty. So he's a good kid. Shout out he's, to Brian. Yeah. Good old Brian. Brian's got a good book out too. If you haven't read his book, he should, cause it's very entertaining, very entertaining to say the least. It's great this time of year too. Uh, everybody's looking for a little stocking stuffer. The name yeah. of Brian's book is there's just one problem. Uh, and if you're looking for books to get wrestling fans, may I recommend grateful by Eric Bischoff, both out just in time for the holiday season. Next up, we would see Jeff Jarrett come out. He's supposed to wrestle crush, but Jeff keeps calling him chains and he's complaining that Vince is not living up to his end of the contract. He's supposed to have a catered meal and bottled water, and he doesn't want to wrestle chains because he's not at his level. Kane's going to come out and destroy crush and do a bunch of no sell spots. Chains was never there. Jarrett just kept calling him the wrong name. And that's actually the end of Brian Adams in the WWF until he comes back as a part of chronic. As the story goes, I think he wanted to go to WCW too. He wanted to leave out of allegiance to Bret Hart. Is that the way you heard it? Yeah. I was encouraging it. Okay. You were done with that. Yeah. 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 He, he wanted out. He wasn't moving the needle to any significant degree in WWE. Uh, he was there largely as a favor to the undertaker. In my opinion, a taker, very loyal, one of his more, one of his great flattering traits, loyalty. He proved that with Vince over the zillion year career. And, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I was personally, <coughs> personally in my role, I was ready to see him get a fresh start someplace else. Goldust and Vader are building towards a match at the pay-per-view, but Dustin needs surgery and Kane and Ahmed Johnson also supposed to take place, but Ahmed gets in a car crash and now isn't cleared. So we got lots of problems, but maybe the biggest problem is Austin's neck without a doubt, Ford, right? Steve Austin has gotten back reports from two neck specialists last week. Dr. Joseph Torg viewed a tape of his match from MSG and how he protected himself working his new style. I said, as long as he doesn't take any bumps on his neck, he should be okay. Should be okay to wrestle with no significant risk of paralysis. Those are some key words in there. Mm-hmm. However, a second doctor examined his neck and said that with the wrong bump, permanent paralysis was still a possibility. And the second doctor's opinion kind of freaked Austin out. Although he wrestled all week, usually being in the ring about 90 seconds total. Are you in constant communication? Checking in with him on a pretty regular basis to see how he's feeling. If regular means every day. Yes. Okay. Cause Steve didn't share his, uh, feelings a lot, uh, with anybody. Uh, I was blessed to have that relationship with him and I still do. Uh, and I, I love the guy like his family, uh, but he was, he was concerned, but he thought that, you know, if he could just master the art of a, a new presentation, uh, for himself, that he'd be okay. And uh, he could get by and luckily for him, he did. And, uh, you know, now to the fact I saw a video the other day on Twitter, by the way, you can follow me on Twitter at J R S B B Q and Conrad is at, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. Yes, sir. Uh, And you can get all that good stuff, but nonetheless, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, we talked every day. How you feeling? Do you have any numbness here? Blah, blah, blah. And sometimes it was just talk about 
we just talked about things that, uh, you know, not, we didn't go into the details like, Hey, uh, Steve, uh, do you have any tingling today? Are you losing any more of, of your senses, you know, your, your sensibilities, your senses, your physical senses. Uh, sometimes we talked about football or food or, you know, what have you been, what are you going to do today type deal to get him off that topic? So, yeah, we, we talked just, if we didn't talk every day, it was a rarity. If we didn't talk every day, it was a text or a, or, or voicemail or something like that, but he, he needed to share his feelings and, and I was there to listen and I'm proud that I had that, that, that opportunity. Let's, uh, let's talk about another opportunity that we've got. And that's for Dan Severn. He's going to come in for another round of negotiations with you. That's all according to Dave Meltzer. He would freestyle. It appears the WBF wants to go with Michaels versus Austin undertaker versus Kane and Shamrock versus Severn at WrestleMania. Severn doesn't want to come in and just be put in a spot to put Shamrock over. They offered him a program besides the Shamrock program and Severn asked the WWF to put it all in writing and that's where everything stands. But if he goes, the decision to go will probably be made within the next few weeks. So we know we would see Dan in the WWF. It's not much of a run, but we still get him. What do you remember about these negotiations or dealings you had with Dan, the beast Severn? Danny is such a class guy. Uh, he, he meant well. Uh, his, his dialogue in, in our meetings is, was well-intended. Some of the things he wanted guaranteed, I couldn't guarantee, you know, it's hard to guarantee wins and losses. Uh, there's so many things to take into consideration when you're talking about that topic. Uh, but Dan was a class act, you know, he was a, a, a guy that he's a kind of guy, Conrad, that I, I really encouraged to be in our locker room, uh, maturity. He was a success. He's a tough guy, uh, low maintenance, at least he was in my eyes. And, uh, so I, I, I enjoyed my opportunities to work with Dan Severin. And, uh, last time I saw him, we had a great talk and he got along fine. And, uh, but Dan was short on charisma. He was a little short on charisma. Uh, and he'll probably admit that to you, but he was just a, I, I enjoyed working with him. I just, you know, he wasn't going to have the charisma that some of our guys did, but, uh, he, that animalistic charisma, he had plenty of that. And, uh, we just had to figure a way to package it and harness it and then present it. So, uh, but like I said, Dan Severn's the kind of guy you want in your locker room. If you have the opportunity to sign him. Well, you've got an opportunity right now to start feeling better and taking a little better care of yourself. Dan Severn may have been short on charisma, but AG one is not short on the things you need to get your day started. Right. Maybe you don't have enough time to take care of yourself or so you say, maybe you want better gut health. Maybe you want more energy. Maybe you want to optimize your immune system. Maybe you hate taking pills or vitamins. Maybe you want a supplement that actually tastes great. No matter the reason you need to start taking AG one. My wife and I actually started this long before they were a sponsor at the start of the pandemic. She was sold on the idea that this would help us optimize our immune system. And it worked with one delicious scoop of AG one. You're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day. Right. It's going to help you with all the things guys really think about this, your immune system, your gut health, your nervous system, your energy, your focus, your recovery, your aging, you're checking all those boxes with just one delicious scoop. It's also lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy free or gluten free, there's less than one gram of sugar. There's no GMOs. There's no nasty chemicals. There's no artificial anything and it still tastes good. It's going to support better sleep quality and recovery. It's going to support mental clarity and alertness. Think of it as like your all in one nutritional insurance. By the way, I want to mention AG one has over 7,000 five-star reviews. That's amazing. And right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. 
And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year case, a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash JR. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash JR to take ownership of your health, pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. We thank Athletic Greens for sponsoring today's podcast. It's good stuff, huh, Jim? Great company, yeah, great company. Uh, they they help you. They they do a good job, and it's a product. You know, we were talking about. And you may have just mentioned it. Uh, the uh, amount of five star ratings. Yeah, tons. It's amazing, and as you and I both have said uh, before on this show, it's to stop and do stop what you're doing, and to give a five star rating pretty cool deal so it's a good product thousands of people are using it and they're loving it so if you want to feel better maintain better better health this is uh this is a place to start uh i i uh i'm really happy they're a sponsor me too man and you're gonna love the way it tastes take it from me it's good stuff and uh, i can't recommend it enough why not try it get yourself a free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin d five free travel packs too that's athleticgreens.com forward slash J-R. See. I love this. This song makes me feel like I need some Athletic Greens. This is a good beat. Hey, guys. Eric Bischoff here. and just want to call a quick timeout. I want to tell your listeners about what I've been telling everybody at over at 83 weeks quite a while now. About all the cool things that are happening over at adfreeshows.com. Conrad sits down with World Class's David Manning and JCP's David Crockett to take a month-by-month look back through the territory. But uh, the other wrestlers didn't until the birds came along. And the birds were, as heels, selling a, sell, you know, they were right up there in the same area of sales as the Von Erics. Well, that's fascinating. I just assumed that the guys always, quote-unquote, kept their picture money. If you're looking for more old school, the creator of the Aftermax, Bill After, has joined ad-free shows, revisiting some of his favorite interviews and stories. It's a picture backstage of Lou Albano before he was a captain, handing the WWWF original belt to Ivan Koloff, and that was an exclusive photo that I took in the a dressing room hallway of the uh, of the garden. Looking for interactive experiences, Conrad recently sat down with Ad Free Shows members for a live edition of Ask Conrad. I think Cena would be a big one. I mean, I understand uh, that that's probably not going to happen. If I had a guy like Logan Paul trying to wrestle Cena, I think that's that's probably as big as it could get. So I could I could be convinced of that. I don't think Punk will be available, but I do disagree with Rick. I think that would be huge. I think hardcore fans would absolutely love it. Get this and other exclusive experiences, including being part of the live recordings of the podcast. Now you can be part of the show. That's just a small taste of what we've got waiting for you with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. Hey, let's, uh, let's talk about Roanoke, Virginia, November 25th. We're going to do a raw taping here the day after our North Carolina expose of Bret Hart, if you will. We've got 6,542 fans here. They're paying 76,000 and change. You're starting to see more and more houses, especially the TV taping start to build up. We, we've been a long way from selling out routinely, but man, we're, we're getting some momentum now. And, uh, the attitude era is about to be here. They spent more of the show talking about Bret Hart this time claiming they have footage of uh, survivor series with Bret Hart and Vince McMahon, and they're going to end the controversy. The footage doesn't air to the last 10 minutes of the show. And they simply show Bret Hart looking at the referee and Hebner signaling for the bell claiming Bret was looking and it was Hebner, not Vince who signaled to make the call. So therefore Bret must have submitted. Must have submitted. Had to happen. Hey, this was a stupid ratings ploy. Yeah. As they never showed McMahon as this was happening. Bait and switch never works. Never works. And it didn't work that night either. I um I don't really understand why we're still obsessed with Bret Hart here. I I mean, we're this is gonna be the go home episode for the freaking pay per view. 
you would think that we would want to focus more on selling the pay-per-view and less on talking about Bret Hart, but yet here we are. We're just, we're, we're, we're beating a dead horse as the old Southern expression goes. Yeah. Beating the hell out of him. The horse can't even get back up on his knees. It was horrible. And again, we've, I think we've clarified that this thing has been overkill. Yes. And if you and I never do another show that involves this topic, I'm good with it. I'm good with it too, Connie. Yeah. We've got the, uh, the light heavyweight title tournament starting with Takamichi Noku defeating Aguilera. Of course, we know eventually he'd become S.A. Rios. We're going to interview Goldust and Luna. Goldust now has pink hair like Dennis Rodman, and he's wearing a, a jock strap on the outside and a spiked bra and doing this S&M bondage gimmick, as you see if you're watching uh, with us here on YouTube, which by which the way. You should be, by the way. You yes. should be. Grilling Jr. on youtube.com, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, turn the notifications bell on not just full episodes here, but it's, it's a nice way to introduce, uh, the show to the, the new wrestling fan in your life. Maybe he's a little intimidated by our runtime. Sometimes here you go. Little bite sizes for it. Uh, rock is going to come out and beat Vader five minutes and nine seconds. Austin is going to drive his uh, truck into the arena, get on the hood, drink a beer. And man, this is incredible. The reaction to Austin as a baby face, Rocky as a heel, and, and we're continuing to evolve this Austin character, pickup trucks and middle fingers and beers. And the character has really taken a foothold with the audience here. Oh, no doubt. He, let's say he got over. Yeah. And he got over more and more and more and more. Cordette's also going to interview Mero and Sable here. And Meltzer would say that the heat was actually great here. Mero winds up yelling at Sable. She tries to cry. Mero tells her to leave. So this is the beginning of the split here. And speaking of Sable, Sable's even going to be a ring card girl on the December 6th, Oscar de la Hoya boxing pay-per-view. So we're doing some sort of cross promotion, I suppose. Yeah. Butterbean's going to work the pay-per-view for us. We're going to send Sable over. But that's really the first time she gets anything in the quote unquote mainstream, right? Yeah, I think so. As I recall, I think you're right on that one. She's uh hey look, her image is those that are watching us on the YouTube channel right now. Uh you couldn't get enough sable on your television screen. No. She was a star and and, and very, very photogenic. Uh and just a great personality in that and as far as her image was concerned. We didn't hear her talk a lot. Uh, she wasn't a trained thespian, but she had this amazing charisma that, uh, again, that male 18 to 49 year old demographic just embraced. This is, um, also something we want to mention it's official. Vince is going to take himself off of commentary. So Jr. and Jim Cornette will do the first hour of Monday night raw. And then Jr. and Jerry Lawler will do the second hour of Monday night raw. So hour one for Cornette, hour two for Lawler and Meltzer would say McMahon has done this in the past a few times, but in every case, he winds up being back on the program in a few weeks. Did you think this one would take because of the Mr. McMahon character or not quite yet? Didn't know. Didn't know. Didn't have any idea. Uh, I was hope I was hopeful because that's good for me, my cash and creative. Uh, but you know, I, 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 I was just playing along. Every, just tag me in when you need me. Yes. You know, I'll be available. Uh, I can handle it. And I think that's what I proved at that point in time that, that I could handle it. And then Cornette, uh, was a great partner. But it's hard to supplant uh, how good Lawler and I were together, and because Lawler's going to stay out of, the, out of the fire, he was going to stay off the radar. Uh, he wasn't going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, uh, he, he he was predictable. He was talented, and we had great chemistry. That's the thing about Jerry and my work together. We had great chemistry. Uh, so anyway, it was it was a. Uh, a unique opportunity for me to finally get that spot in the chair. I wanted to be in the chair. And as it worked out, I was in the chair for a long time. Is it hard to do it with two different partners? I mean, no. easy for you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I, and the reason for that Conrad is because I had a great rapport with both guys. Mm -hmm. I had worked with both guys. So it wasn't like a feeling out process. So no, it was, it wasn't hard. As a matter of fact, it was easy. Quite frankly, I, I had two great partners that, uh, made me, made me look better than I was. The end of raw features a total destruction of Jim Neidhart after his match with triple H Sean's going to spray paint WCW on Neidhart's back after a pedigree <laughs> on the chair. Somehow that awakens the rhino and he gets up and double clotheslines them before China attacks and they handcuff him to the ropes and beat him up before slaughter comes. And eventually the big pop is when Ken Shamrock comes in big belly to belly on Sean. And we get the, uh, ankle lock on him. Sean's tapping like crazy slaughter gets the camel clutch on Helmsley. The crowd is going banana. And the branding of the show is called DX. So I guess that's kind of what we're doing here is, is building some heat for that. But the observer is pretty critical of this saying the WWF's degeneration X concept as a top heel contingent is almost a total knockoff of the WCW concept of the NWO, the trendy misspellings, the gestures designed to get heels over as cult baby faces, the personalities, ironically, key members of both groups. Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, Six, Shawn Michaels, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley, the so-called click, they're all basically the same. In fact, there would be no Degeneration X heel group in the company as the company would have never gone in such a direction had WCW not been so successful in the same direction. What do you think? Do you think DX is just a ripoff of the NWO or was it different? Well, I thought it was a little different because of different personalities, but in theory, it was a lot alike. Uh, but so was it like the four horsemen? Yeah. Right. So what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, but I, I thought that, uh, if, if it works in one territory, as the old expression goes, Conrad, uh, it'll work in another territory. And I think that's kind of where we were, uh, that this, it was too good a deal not to try. And then you had guys that were fresh and, and given an opportunity to do something different. And, uh, also to contribute mightily to their creative. So, uh, yeah, it was, it has some similarities. So there's no doubt about that, but, uh, I, I thought it was for the better. I mean, DX got over, they sold a lot of merchandise I, I was, and I was never a big fan of, uh, creating heels that fans cheered. I found it to be hypocritical and somewhat oxymoronic. Uh, so, you know, it was, but it was a lot of talent on, on the screen. Uh, there was just a lot of talents being utilized and, uh, I liked that. I, I, I liked DX. I thought they did a hell of a job and they were, they were polarizing. Quite frankly, they were very polarizing and they were very talented. And when they wrestled, they, re they delivered, they delivered and they kept reinventing themselves and adding a little, this a little wrinkle here and a little wrinkle there. So, uh. I was a DX fan and, and still am. I think that was one of the more creative and, and entertaining, uh, scenarios that, that I worked with there in, in, uh, WWE is the, the invention and the innovation that uh, DX was able to bring the show itself. The pay-per-view we're finally here. Does 144,000 buys. You go back a year prior and you take a look at in your house. It's time from December. 1996, which was Bret Hart and Sid for the WWF title. Well, that show only did 97,000 buys. So year over year, we went from 97,000 to 144,000. That is a positive sign that we're headed in the right direction. Yep. It is down from the last in your house, which was October. That was bad blood where we saw the debut of Kane and that cage match, the first ever hell in a cell with Shawn Michaels and undertaker. That one did 186,000. We're way down from survivor series, but it was one of the big four back in the day. They got 284,000, of course, with Sean and Brett on top, uh, the readers. Well, they didn't really like this show the readers of the observer. They give it 76% thumbs down. I tend to agree. It's kind of a weird show. Let's jump into it. It's December self, December 7th, Springfield, Massachusetts. The civic center here has 6,358 fans. They paid 112,864 bucks with another 44,000 in merchandise 
Perhaps the strongest sight was of Jim Cornette doing the mean Gene Todd Pettengill doc roll as the pre-show pitch master, the last minute hype, uh, with Sonny on the shelf with a broken foot. Uh, it's, uh, the Jackal with Kevin Kelly in the 900 room, Jim Cornette selling pay-per-views. That's uh that's gotta be good for business. Does it not Jim? Yeah. He's a great salesman and yes. he had his own way of presenting things. Yeah, Corning was, Corning was so talented. He could do, he could be successful in a lot of roles, Conrad. And this is just one of them. So it was fresh, new, and Cornette knew the product and he knows how to sell. Our first match is, uh, maybe something we thought would be a bigger deal one day. Of course, on the other channel, the cruiserweights have just been tearing it up for WCW. So the WWF wants in on that action. So we're going to crown the first light heavyweight champion here. With Takamichi Noku taking on Brian Christopher, Meltzer would say it was a styles clash. It's a Southern style versus a Lucha style. Of course, Taka gets his hand raised in 12 minutes and two seconds, a three-star affair, and they have an in-ring ceremony presenting Michinoku with the belt after posing for Japan photos with Tony Gurria, Gerald Briscoe, and Pat Patterson. So it's hyped as a big moment, but it almost feels like after this, we don't even really make it a big deal anymore. Did Vince just lose interest very quickly? Yeah. It was more based on the, the talent that was available for this. I think that he lost interest. Yeah. He was never a fan of the smaller talents. Uh, they the rugby, the right, right place. So well, what about Ray? Look, you can't compare Ray to everybody else. Right. He's extraordinary. I agree. And a good hire. And uh, he's still at it by the way. So. Uh, I, uh, I just think Vince lost interest and, you know, just simple as that. The taco Michinoku and Brian Christopher could work with a match as good as anybody, but it just didn't have the interest of the, of the guy that was making the decisions. Well, next up match number two, we got Miguel Perez, uh, Jesus Castillo and Jose Estrada jr. Of the Los Periquas. Taking on the disciples of apocalypse chain skull and eight ball. It goes seven minutes and 57 seconds. Mercifully it was over. The match was not good, but the finish was according to Dave Meltzer. It gets a quarter of a star. I'm we said that Vince lost interest in the light heavyweight. I lost interest in gang wars. It's time to put a bullet in these. <laughs> I'm with you. I would signed off on that one too. Enough is enough. I can't stands anymore. Next up, we've got Butterbean and Mark Miro and what Meltzer would call an almost hilarious in the sense of all the political red tape involved in the billing of this match. It couldn't be called a boxing match because boxing is regulated and theoretically it can't be worked. It couldn't be called a boxing exhibition because Butterbean had a fight. If you could call it that the previous night in athletics in Atlantic city and the athletic commissions wouldn't allow anyone to take two boxing matches that close together. So instead they call it a tough man contest, but the problem is they're using these giant gloves instead of 12 ounce gloves. I think we're using 16s. Uh, yeah. Maybe it maybe an 18 melts or even freestyles. The point is though, it's a four round tough man contest and it ends with a low blow in round four, 10 seconds in. So Butterbean gets the win by DQ. This is just. Not good. Is this, is this, uh, Russo's idea? Is this something Vince was, I don't remember whose idea Conrad. It just, it it didn't work. Yeah. It it didn't work. As simple as that. Hell, I don't know, uh, whose idea it was. Maybe we can just designate somebody to shit all over them. That might be something we're interested in today. I don't know, but I'm uh, for it. Who would you like to shit on? Let's just pick a name out of a hat and we'll take turns. (laughs) Oh man. Have you ever seen this boxing gimmick work in wrestling? I'm not trying to sound like a fucking know it all, but like anytime we're going to work boxing, it feels like it always comes off hokey. Like the only time that I can remember anything worth really investing your time and, and, uh, and was, uh, the finals with, with Mark Gunn and, uh, and Butterbean. But those were, that was real. I mean, yeah. that's, yeah. yeah, it was real. And but I mean, as uh, far as he worked boxing match in wrestling, that's kind of, eh, is it not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we did a lot of, eh. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't disagree. Uh, Meltzer thought the same as we did. He gave this a dud. 
and said, um, yeah, there's got to be a method to the madness here somewhere. Next we're up, looking for it. We're still trying to find it all these years later, and we're, it's still undiscoverable. It is. So speaking of undiscoverable, what the hell were we thinking? Goldust is going to come out with Luna, and they're going to do an interview where Goldust is going to read from Dr. Seuss's Green Eggs and Ham. Yep. That's yes. on pay-per-view. Next up, we got Billy Gunn and Jesse James, the New Age Outlaws, as they're going to become. Retain the WWF tag team titles, beating the Legion of Doom by DQ in 10 minutes and 33 seconds. It too gets a dud rating, but Meltzer would say Gunn and James are due for an even bigger uh, push in the future. And they get the belts because LOD is going to be taken off to the books after this week and take a relatively short hiatus. But still, this is uh, the coming out party in this era for the New Age Outlaws. I don't think anybody would have probably predicted how hot they would get. Yeah. But these are two guys who've been around the company for quite a while. And you've been looking for something for them, whether it was rockabilly or the roadie. And it's like, when this happened, this is exactly what you guys and they have been looking for. Right? Yeah, it was, they found their calling and it, their calling was never decided by their lack of skills. Uh, Billy and, uh, and Brian are outstanding performers outstanding performers and they were hungry as Charles Barkley would say, because sometimes when you're hungry, you get hangry yes. and they had it. They had, they, they, they had, they had spent their, they had paid their dues for the lack of a better overused cliche. And they were looking for something that was going to help make them more money and become bigger stars. And I, and I think we found it in the new age outlaws. They just, they clicked, they clicked and, and it worked. Next up, we got Hunter Hearst Helmsley beating Sergeant Slaughter in a boot camp match. It goes way too damn long, 17 minutes and 39 seconds. Meltzer would say they didn't miss as many moves or have a total lack of psychology, but they booked this to go way too long. And because of Sarge's physical condition, nobody really took him seriously. Meltzer would say he thinks Slaughter's at least 40 pounds overweight. He's 49 years old, or at least that's what they're billing him as but it looks like he's moving in slow motion quote, almost like watching a guy trying to do a pro wrestling match while in a swimming pool. Uh, either way though, when it's all said and done, the pedigree on the chair gets it finished. Of course, China comes along and hits a low blow to set all that up. Uh, negative two stars, you know, listen, you're trying to uh, call something that's bowling shoe ugly with a guy who's a comrade of yours, Sergeant slaughter. Yeah. We're all trying to make chicken salad here. No. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I'm glad Sarge got booked. I'm glad Sarge got another, uh, few moments in the spotlight. Uh, but I'm with you, uh, a a better story could have been told in a shorter length of time. And, uh, 17 minutes is entirely too long, uh, considering Sarge's age, his physical conditioning and so forth. It was a significant victory. We tried to put Sarge over as this legendary guy and, uh, thought we did a decent job of that. But uh, it was just too long. It was just too long. It didn't need to be as long as it was. Jeff Jarrett is out next. He's going to beat The Undertaker. That's right. Jeff Jarrett beat The Undertaker, but by DQ in six minutes and 56 seconds. Because as you see there, if you're watching on YouTube, Kane comes down and interferes, choke slams Jarrett. So Jeff becomes the winner by DQ. It's all about setting up this collision course of Kane and The Undertaker. But Boy, Dave can't help himself and take some shots at Jeff Jarrett. He says after undertaker left, Jarrett got to strut in the ring. And if you look up the phrase, quote unquote, not getting over in your dictionary, (laughs) I'll have a photo of Jarrett in that Mayan Indian outfit next to the phrase. What'd you think of this odd attire that Jeff Jarrett was wearing here? It was, uh, perplexing. (laughs) It was perplexing. I didn't, I never good. I never did understand the, uh, the exact reasoning for some of these things, but, uh, we can say that about a lot of stuff we've talked about here today. It was a mystery. Sometimes I look back on a Conrad and I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm in amazement that I, I hung in there as long as I did. Yeah. No kidding. Cause it was just, it was just the shits after the shits that, you know, it's, there ain't enough toilet paper in the world to clean that up. Next up it's Steve Austin and the rock. But before we get there. The rock is backstage Rocky Mavia here doing a promo with doc Hendricks 
And this is the first time where we would see the rock cut someone off. He would call himself the rock, call himself the people's champion again, and then throw us what I believe is the first ever people's eyebrow. He's adding stuff to his repertoire every single week, getting bigger and better every single week. And what's next? The seventh match on this pay-per-view is indeed Steve Austin versus the rock on pay-per-view. Yes, it's going to main event three WrestleManias, but this is humble beginnings here. Five minutes and 32 seconds. Austin gets the win. When he comes to the ring in his pickup truck, it is the biggest reaction of the show by far. And, um, given his limitations of big fresh off this neck injury, Meltzer thought it was an amazing match because you can't expect much more from him here in that regard. Two and a quarter stars, but still working this close after the, the injury on a pay-per-view with a, a new hot heel. We're asking a lot for Steve Austin, but he delivered. He did deliver. And so did Dwayne, you know, Dwayne just getting into, getting into the dance. And, uh, I, I, I thought they had a, a real good performance and to show their intelligence, uh, they went five minutes. Yes. They didn't ask for more time than I'm aware of. And so it was, uh, it was fun. It was fun, a fun match and a match that you could tell had great legs, long, strong legs, uh, for these two cats. Next up is our main event for the world title. Shawn Michaels is going to be defending against Ken Shamrock and believe it or not, Ken Shamrock wins. But once again, it's by DQ. So Michaels uh, will retain, um, too Meltzer many DQs, said, Conrad, too many DQs. Those are weak finishes. We've got to be creative enough to have somebody win with their finish or lose because of the other guy's finish or something. But it was just, it was ridiculous. How, how many disqualifications we had or count outs or what have you, uh, to appease a talent, you know, nobody can win or lose as if anybody gives a shit. They didn't trust me. And uh, certainly in this scenario, uh, shamrock beating Sean by disqualification meant absolutely zilch. The, uh, the match Meltzer would say had Shawn Michaels taking a lot of great bumps early and Shamrock, he thought looked uh, robotic in spots. Uh, but when it's all said and done, it's, uh, once again, China throwing some low blows and interfering with, uh, Hunter Hearst Helpsley for the DQ and the finish of the pay-per-view Meltzer would say is very weak for the, at least for a pay-per-view main event, three stars here. And listen, I think Shamrock had a heck of a an introduction into this promotion in March when we first see him in action at, uh, as a special guest referee at WrestleMania. But I mean, we, I think the first time we saw him was February to, to be a fan in the crowd in February, a special guest referee in March and close the year in a pay-per-view main event for the title. Pretty strong ass start for a guy new to wrestling. No. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a nice start, nice start. And you know, it just showed glimpses of how viable Kenny Shamrock could have been if he had been booked better. And of course there's lots of criticism about the DQs, but after the match is over, we give fans what they really want a surprise. All three are going to throw Shamrock over the top. And as Shawn Michaels is celebrating out of nowhere, Owen Hart runs in, knocks him off the apron. He's taking his uh, monthly bump through the Spanish announce table. Owen's going to jump on him, start pounding away, ripping at the nose, apparently to draw blood, to give the illusion that the punches themselves were real before disappearing into the crowd. The ending was great. Owen's return was spectacular. I think everybody was curious. Where's this going? What's the payoff? What's next for the Hart family and the Hart foundation. But Owen now is working with the top guy, the world champ to close a pay-per-view I don't think anybody would have ever wanted that to be the way this happened, but now with Brett out of the way, Owen's the top part in the promotion. No. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. <clears throat> no doubt. And, uh, I was sure glad to have him back. He lightened the load in the locker room. Just a, a good human being. God, I miss him. I mean, when we do these shows, that's part of the, one of the benefits or the value added is we get a chance to talk a little bit more about Owen. Uh, but yeah, that was a, it was a good, it was a good close to the show and some might say it saves the show's ass and I can't disagree with that. 
you sort of alluded to it earlier. When Owen does come back, he's going to come back with a big raise. I'm happy for him on that. Yeah. I also kind of thought when this pay-per-view goes off, okay, that's the direction we're headed for the Royal rumble. Because that to me is like normally what you have done historically in wrestling is all right. Well, with this shamrock thing out of the way, what's next for Shawn Michaels. If a guy attacks him, oh, well, that'll be the, the next pay-per-view. In fact, Royal Rumble 1998 being the next show is not Shawn Michaels versus Owen Hart. It's Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker in a casket match. And we know that that casket is ultimately going to be the thing that puts Shawn on the shelf for quite a while, for years. But why was the Owen thing dropped so quickly, do you think, Jim? You know, I don't know. It's, it's, it wasn't Owen's doing. Right. So it might've been the fact that Sean didn't want to work with him or maybe uh, Vince didn't see him as a top guy. Do you think, or maybe Vince didn't see him as a, as a top guy. Yeah. Which if that was the case, then that was a stupid error. Yeah. It's a mistake. Uh, yeah. Big mistake. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm, all, I've been a big Owen Hart fan since day one. And he, he, and Brett, he, and excuse me, uh, Owen and Sean would have had some classic matches. Oh my gosh. Yes classic matches and i believe that if owen's name last name was anything but heart sean would have embraced it and maybe he did embrace it but it didn't seem that way it didn't seem that way it felt as if vince did what he needed to do to make sure owen was back gives him a big raise and now he's just gonna i don't know i really would have liked to have seen that at the january pay-per-view i think we could have played off of when we had sean collapse on raw Many folks remember it was an enziguri from Owen Hart that quote unquote put him down. There could have been a lot of history there, just playing off the screw job and everything else. It's not to be. Instead, he's going to join the nation and it's going to be an interesting 1998. Yeah. Uh, but I'll tell you what else is interesting. And that's all the different products that we've got at jrsbbq.com. Yes, maybe sir. my favorite and maybe the most interesting, at least to me, the all purpose seasoning. You can use it on anything. You can put it on your eggs, put it on your chicken, put it on your fish, put it on your steak, put it on your pork, <laughs> uh, but just put it in your shopping cart. It's jrsbbq.com. You're taking a look there and seeing it. If you're with us over on YouTube, it's grilling jr on youtube.com. But now the hot sauce, man, tell us about it. What's going on at jrsbbq.com? Having a hard time keeping it in stock, but it is in stock. JR's red S uh, hot sauce is a hit. You know, it took us long enough to get it on the shelves, so to speak. And to get it ready to be shipped and so forth, but uh, it's it's good. And right now, you know, we're filling, we're working seven days a week there, Marlowe's shop there in Norman, uh, and getting these orders out promptly and quickly. Uh, and so it's it's far exceeded our expectations, Conrad. And I'm so happy that fans are trying it and liking it, and then now they're buying multiple bottles uh, for a, a holiday gifts. So uh, we thank everybody for their support in that regard. But a lot of these gift packages are great. They got a little bit of everything in them. You can design your own, whatever, however you want to do it. JRSBBQ.com is the place to go. And uh, we hope that you'll try our goods and, 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 uh, it might not be as sexy as manscape, but, it, <laughs> but it's a, it's a gift that will be talked about, uh, with the family as one of the favorite holiday gifts, uh, for the season. So give us a shout, try us out jrsbbq.com we're going to ship your order within a day or two of receiving it so uh it's a it's just been great it's been there's this been a it's been a, a good season and we're not dealing with covid right now you know covid kicked our ass big time back in the day so now we're past that and uh, we're shipping orders out on a timely basis and we hope that you'll give us a try because it's labor of love and i sure do appreciate everybody's business jrsbbq.com something for everybody the chipotle ketchup the main event mustard the red ass hot sauce you got original barbecue sauce and hot barbecue sauce and let me recommend doing the the bundle you can get the whole five pack it is the ultimate gift for the wrestling fan in your life and and may i recommend if you're not going with a bundle and you're just going to buy single bottles buy a few even when you gift it don't just gift one bottle let me explain they're going to want to put one bottle on a shelf next to their wrestling collectibles and roll tide. Lord bless them. We thank them for that. Yep. And if you just buy a second bottle, well, they're going to try that one, but here's a little fat guy pro tip. If you get them three bottles, they'll have one to display one to try themselves. And then you call a week later 
What'd you think of JR's barbecue sauce? Oh, I loved it, man. I've been wanting to try it and just leave that hanging. They're going to invite you over. They're going to cook some barbecue. You're going to get to try the barbecue. Barbecue brings people together. It's for yes. sharing. It's for the whole family. Check it out. JRsbbq.com. You're going to love not only the product, but what it does for your family when it brings you together. That's right. And that's really the, about, that's kind of what holidays are about, right? Connie. Absolutely. Bringing 100%. the families together with a wholesome product that's made in America. That's got a, you know, that we, it's been time tested now it's selling. Yes. And, and I sure do uh, love the support. It makes me feel it's probably the best Christmas gift that I get personally every year is to see that we got orders coming in and I really, really do appreciate it. I also want to mention uh, we've got some fun events going down over at adfreeshows.com. Not only get these shows early and ad free, you get to do it live today. We did it with a live studio audience. I want to shout out some of the folks in the chat, whether it's coach Rosie or David or Eddie Prather, man, we had a, a whole bunch of fun today with guys like Bobby and Jamie and uh, Ken was with us and Keith was with us and we appreciate everybody showing up and asking questions and being a part of what we're doing here. And, uh, the only way to join in on all this fun is adfreeshows.com. Just last week, we sat down with Kevin Nash and Sean Oliver and watched the main event from Starcade 98, where Goldberg streak ended at the hands of Kevin Nash. He was not only the new champion, but also the booker. And you got to ask him anything you wanted coming up later this month. We've brought Nick Patrick around for the 25th anniversary of Starcade 97. Wow. I'm going to moderate a conversation between Eric Bischoff, the guy who was supposedly running the show and Nick Patrick, who was supposed to have a fast count, but did not It's the introduction of Bret Hart into the main event. It's the crowning achievement for sting and WCW finally beating Hulk Hogan in the NWO but it didn't go quite according to plan. And on December 28th, right after AEW dynamite, we're going to have both of those guys together at adfreeshows.com. You don't want to miss it. That's cool. It is cool. We're having fun here. And you and I keep the fun going next week. We're going to talk about bill Goldberg's run in the WWE. We'll talk about how you ran that negotiation and brought him in the big time entrance against the rock, all the attempts to humanize him like the silly wig what Bill's attitude was in this era. And then of course the infamous match at WrestleMania with Brock Lesnar, where Steve Austin was the referee. It's going to be restaurant quality folks next week, right here on grill and Jr. Absolutely. Love to have your interaction on the show. If you've got a question about Goldberg or anything else, it's at Jr. grilling on Twitter and Instagram It's grilling Jr. on Facebook. Of course he is on Facebook at Jr's BBQ on Twitter. And at Jim Ross BBQ on Facebook, on Instagram, he's Jim Ross BBQ. You can get all the handles here. If you'll check us out over on YouTube, really would love to have you hit the subscribe button on our YouTube. It's grilling Jr. on YouTube. Uh, this was a lot of fun today, man. I don't know what I expected, but we covered DX. We covered Rick rude. We covered Owen Hart. We covered Ken Shamrock. It was an interesting time. 1997. Was it not? Yeah, it was. It, you you want to. You always want to find the good in any of these generations, these years, these months, these pay-per-views. We do our best to do that. Uh, I think sometimes I get a little too negative. No, uh, but you know, I hope I don't. But uh, I'll just I tell the truth, Connie. Yeah, I tell the truth, and sometimes it suits people, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so I, I'm uh, I'm really really happy that we're able to do this every week, and I hope you tell your friends about our show and and direct them over to that YouTube page, man. Yes. That's, a, that's the money. I think, I think it's, you got a little TV show going on and enjoy it. Check it out. We greatly appreciate the support grilling Jr. on youtube.com. And we'll be back next week. Talking all things, Bill Goldberg right here on grilling Jr. with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. We appreciate you guys very much. We're grateful for your support and uh, we look forward to talking to you again in about a week. See you soon. Thank <laughs> you.